Testing. Testing. We can hear you, sir. Thank you. So uh, we were waiting just a minute because the conference oh, and caucus were um, meeting, but I think we will begin. Since this is a hybrid, uh, do we begin a countdown to begin it, or do we just proceed? Okay. Um, so uh, this hearing will come to order, and without objection, the chair is authorized to declare a recess at any time. Before I deliver my opening uh, remarks, I wanted to note uh, that today the committee is meeting <clears throat> both in person and virtually, and I want to announce a couple of reminders to the members about the conduct of this hearing. First, members and staff who are attending in person and, and who are unvaccinated against COVID-19 need to stay uh, masked throughout the hearing. <clears throat> unvaccinated members may remove their masks only during their questioning under the five-minute rule, or of course, unvaccinated persons can also attend remotely. Members who are attending virtually should keep their video feed on as long as they are present in the hearing. Members are responsible for their own microphones, and please also keep your microphones muted unless you're speaking. And finally, if members have documents they wish to submit for the record, please email them to the committee clerk whose email address was circulated prior to the hearing. I want to say good morning and uh, thank uh, Chairwoman Johnson for agreeing to hold this hearing. She is in her district uh, with the First Lady of the United States today, and I am uh, honored to be able to chair this hearing on wildlife um, fire science, uh, and I think it's very clear that in the uh, 2021 fire season, uh, we've already had that begin. It's on pace to be much worse than last year, already over 100,000 more acres of American wildland have burned uh, than by this point in time in 2020. Firefighters in my home state of California are currently battling at least six large fire wildfires throughout the state. As a Californian, this is cause for alarm. In 2020 alone, the U.S. saw record wildfires burn 10 million acres of land, over 4 million of which were in California. In 2018, Californian fires uh, only burned two a million acres. The warmer and drier conditions created by climate change have it, uh, increased extreme wildfire conditions with nine more days of higher, high fire potential added every year since uh, 2000. As the risk for catastrophic wildfire grows, so should our ability to forecast wildfires and to mitigate fire risk. Today's hearing presents an opportunity to discuss the current state of wildland fire research and how we can use it to improve our understanding of conditions in the field. We'll also discuss gaps in the science and identify opportunities for further federal investment and coordination. Federal programs like the U.S. Drought Monitor are instrumental in helping our wildland managers prepare for worsening fire seasons. This is just one example of how enhanced coordination among science uh, agencies with operational managers can lead to actionable science. With dedicated authorities and investments in wildfire science, we can develop additional capabilities for real-time detection of fire ignition and even deepen our understanding of wildfire fuels. I was proud to co-sponsor an amendment with my colleague, Mr. Perlmutter, on wildfire resilience research funding at, in the NSF for the Future Act. It was, great, it was a great start to what we can do to strengthen wildlife research, but we must do more. It's not uh, right for Congress not to act to bolster our wildlife re research. It's also uh, dangerous. That's why I'm drafting legislation in this committee to improve the understanding, prediction, and management of wildland fires through robust research initiatives. This bill will also enhance federal interagency collaboration and coordination to include science agencies in federal wildland fire response. I hope this bill uh, will also lead to our federal science agencies working closely with fire managers to ensure that wildfire science can be operationalized to mitigate wildfire risk. We are fortunate to have witnesses today whose testimony will inform this legislation. Join in, joining us are academic researchers who use information provided by agencies like NOAA and NASA and the EPA to build out America's 
wildfire research capacity, and we look forward to hearing from them about opportunities for areas of further investment in wildfire science. Uh, I'd also like to um, extend a warm welcome to Dr. Craig Clements, who is a professor at, yes, San Jose State University, located in my uh, congressional district. Dr. Clements is the director of San Jose State University's Wildfire Interdisciplinary Research Center, which is a leader in wildfire research. Um, I look forward to hearing his testimony about the importance of supporting interdisciplinary wildfire research. We're also fortunate to have with us today some of the bravest people facing the wildfire crisis, our first responders, forest managers, and firefighters intimately understand which innovations best support on the ground needs. This hearing is a critical first step in creating a truly whole of government response to wildfire risk that connects research to operations. We're encouraged by the administration's emphasis on climate resilience and robust funding in the president's budget request for our science agencies to ha tackle extreme weather events. This leaves us ample room to work with appropriators to ensure funding levels in keeping with the magnitude of the wildfire challenges we face. With that, I want to thank our witnesses for their time this morning, and at this point, I would like to yield to the ranking member for any comments he may wish to make. Thank you, and I'd like to thank Chairman, Chairwoman Johnson for holding this hearing and Chairwoman Lofgren for uh, presiding today. Today's hearing is timely as we enter the summer months, which are, have traditionally marked the beginning of wildfire season. However, I am sure many of my Western colleagues would agree that there is really not much of a true wildfire season anymore, with fires occurring year-round. Uh, last year brought haunting images of devastating wildfires across the West. This year, unfortunately, could be even worse. The National Interagency Fire Center reports that the number of fires and acres burned to date are ahead of last year's figures. Given the ongoing drought covering much of the West, it's reasonable to conclude this year's wildfire statistics could be historic. Wildfire is an important part of the ecosystem and often occurs naturally. Many plant species reply, reply, reply rely on wildfire for their growth and regeneration processes, and many animal species look to recently burned lands for their habitat. However, lengthier droughts, hotter temperatures, and poorly maintained federal lands are all contributing to a greater frequency and intensity of wildfires across the country and around the world, which is problematic. Additionally, the increased number of people who live in the wildland urban interface, the area where res residential neighborhoods meet wooded areas, has created the need for a different allocation of resources. While wildfires represent a threat to life and property, they also have devastating environmental impacts, ranging from polluted watersheds to increased carbon dioxide released into the atmosphere. We tend to think of the West as being the most vulnerable to wildfire, but this is an issue for all of us. Resources spent combating wildfire by our federal land management agencies are resources that could be spent on revenue generating recreational activities and are a diversion of attention away from other local emergency response needs. Several agencies within our committee's jurisdiction have a role in combating wildfire. Whether it's NASA providing earth imaging data or NOAA's incident meteorologist helping firefighters plot the path, the best path to fight an ongoing fire. Other agencies such as NSF and NIST engage in research on different aspects of wildlife behavior and how we can better fireproof structures. But we must be certain that all the work of these agencies is carried out in a coordinated manner and is being effectively put into operation by agencies such as the Forestry Service and the Department of Interior. I want to thank our witnesses for appearing before us today. I'm especially pleased to have, welcome George Geisler, who's currently the Washington State Forester. He previously was the State Forester of Oklahoma and can speak to the impacts of wildfire in different parts of the country. I look forward to hearing his thoughts on where there are gaps in federal research, how we can improve coordination among federal agencies, and what actions we can take which would be the most beneficial to him and all the on-ground wildfire responders. I know this is a busy period for him, especially given the record-breaking temperatures most of the West faced this past week, and I thank him for taking time to share his extensive experience with the committee. With that, uh, Madam Chair, I want to thank you, and I yield back. The gentleman yields back, and uh, without objection, 
uh, other members may, who wish may submit opening statements uh, to the record. I'd now like to introduce our witnesses, all of whom are participating remotely. Our first witness uh, today is Dr. Craig Clements. Dr. Uh, Clements is a professor of meteor meteorology at San Jose State University and the director of the Wildfire Interdisciplinary Research Center. He leads research on fire, weather, extreme fire behavior, fire atmosphere interactions, and conducting wildland fire field experiments. Dr. Clements has over 20 years of experience in the meteorological field observations and teaches courses in fire weather, wildfire science, mountain meteorology, climate change, and meteorological instrumentation. Our next witness is Dr. Jessica McCarty. Dr. McCarty is the director of the Geospatial Analysis Center and as of July 1st of this year, an associate professor of geography at Miami University of Ohio. Dr. McCarty has more than 15 years experience in applications of geospatial and data science to accurately quantify wildland and human-caused fire emissions, agriculture and food security, and land cover land use change. She is the co-author author of more than 30 peer-reviewed journal articles, 12 peer-reviewed conference proceedings, three book chapters, four technical reports, four data citations, and one NASA technology transfer. Our third witness uh, as has been mentioned by the ranking member, is Mr. George Geisler, who is Washington State uh, Forester, and he's the Deputy Supervisor for Wildfire and Foreign Forest uh, Health, having previously served in Oklahoma. He has almost 30 years of experience in natural resource and wildland fires, uh, fire management, and six years of experience in structural firefighting as a volunteer in Idaho and New Mexico. He is a member of the Society of American Foresters since 1987 and a certified forester. He joined the Oklahoma Forestry Services in 2006. Before being named a state forester, he served in a staff function to coordinate all forest management activities provided by the agency. And our fourth and final witness today is Chief Eric Litzenberg, recently retired from his position as fire chief for Santa Fe County, New Mexico. Chief Litzenberg served the majority of his career in the City of Santa Fe Fire Department, completing his time in the city as fire chief and city manager before returning to the county where his career began. Through 25 years of service, he has also worked for New Mexico State Forestry and as part of multiple incident management teams and for many years, owned Santa Fe Wildfire, which provided resources for large-scale incident management and response. As our witnesses uh, should know, you will each have five minutes for your spoken testimony. Your entire written testimony will be included in the record of this hearing. When you have completed your spoken uh, testimony, uh, we will begin with questions. There will be, I believe, a little clock on your virtual screen uh, that will count down your five minutes. And when your five minutes are up, we do ask that you uh, uh, sum up so that we can hear all the witnesses before votes are called. So first, we will start with you, Dr. Clements. Good morning, Chairwoman Johnson, Ranking Member Lucas, and members of the committee, including San Jose State's Representative Congresswoman Lofgren, who is chairing this hearing today. Thank you for inviting me to provide testimony on this very important issue. My name is Craig Clements and I serve as director of the Wildfire Interdisciplinary Research Center at San Jose State University. I'm honored to appear before the House Science, Space and Technology Committee for this hearing on the state of federal wildland fire science, examining opportunities for further research and coordination. My testimony will focus on fire weather and fire behavior research and the need for additional federal investment in wildland fire science. At the outset, I'd like to thank Congresswoman Lofgren for advocating for increased wildfire investments across the federal government in her letter to the Biden administration. There is no doubt that wildfires are becoming larger and more severe in Western US. This, is, this trend is projected to continue due to a number of factors, including 100 years of fire exclusion that resulted in increased tree density and dead fuel accumulation, and longer fire seasons and changes in fire weather conditions caused by climate change. Now more than ever, our nation needs to increase investment in fire science to empower decision makers in addressing the complex challenges we face. 
While I won't address all research gaps in wildland fire science today, I will focus on a few key aspects that I believe are important. Fundamental mechanisms of wildfire spread are still poorly understood, especially in the context of extreme events. Additionally, we don't have a good understanding of what role fire atmosphere interactions play on fire spread, nor do we have the appropriate observations to tackle these questions. There's a wide gap between the need for high resolution data to understand fire behavior and the current capabilities of fire observation systems. In terms of observational needs, we need to start treating fire weather the same as we do other severe weather phenomena. We don't have the same levels of funding or dedicated resources for fire weather as we do for severe storms or hurricane research. We need the equivalent of hurricane hunters for wildfire so that we can better see and sample the fire. Additionally, we are missing the appropriate sensors for critical observations. Specifically, we need publicly available high spatial and temporal resolution observations from both space and aircraft. These observations can't just be a snapshot once or twice a day. They need to be continuous over the entire event. Comprehensive observational data sets that include fire weather, plume dynamics, smoke and fire behavior are rare. The fire and smoke model evaluation experiment called FASM, which is a multi-agency program, addresses these data gaps by capitalizing on high intensity prescribed fires, and this should be a national priority. In terms of the prediction of fire behavior, investment is needed in operational community-based coupled fire atmosphere models, which are models that link the fire spread with a weather prediction forecast. These are the only models that can pre best predict how a fire can create its own weather. A community-based model is even more important because it allows researchers from any institution to not only use the model, but to also improve the model and share it with other users. It, this is in contrast to models that are kept in-house and within one agency, institution, or national lab that are not available for other agencies or institutions to use or contribute to. For example, the Open Wildfire Modeling Group facilitated development of the first community fire atmosphere model called WARF S Fire. This model has become a core forecasting system used by many institutions and agencies around the world. Further investment in this fr framework will improve our ability to better predict extreme future fire. In terms of driving the science forward and promoting in innovation, directed funding to agencies that support research and development in the wildfire science needs to be a priority. A few federal agencies are already leading wildfire research efforts, but these are not well coordinated. One exception is the Joint Fire Sciences Program that's had its budget reduced in half. Restoring its budget and even increasing it will benefit wildland fire science. Federal investment should also target competitive grant programs for, that academic institutions can apply for. For example, the National Science Foundation could develop specific wildfire funding programs across its directorates that would fund not only basic research, but also provide more mechanism for research within the social sciences. And finally, and most importantly, in my opinion, is the need to establish a national and sustainable fire weather research program. To date, there's never been a dedicated program that funds both basic and applied research in fire weather, and this is critically needed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Clements. We will now uh, turn to uh, our next witness, Dr. McCarty. We're pleased to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you, Chairwoman Johnson, Chairwoman Lofgren, and Ranking Member Lucas, and distinguished members of the committee. I yeah, appreciate this opportunity to appear today um, to discuss research and coordination switch device. for federal wildfire science. I am Dr. Jessica McCarty, and as of July 1, I am an Associate Professor of Geography at Miami University of Ohio. I have more than 15 years experience in applications of satellites to quantify wildland and human caused fires and related emissions, including as a member of the 2019 NOAA NASA Fire XAQ field campaign. During my testimony, I will highlight the relationship between climate change and wildfires, options to reduce fire risk, solutions for satellite based detection and monitoring, as well as federal wildfire science collaboration. The opinions expressed in my testimony are my own and do not represent views of Miami University. As Dr. Clements has pointed out previously, climate change means warmer temperatures for the entire U.S., witnessed in the increased fire intensity and drier fuel conditions of the western states. Climate change increases drought, le leading to large stands of dry and sometimes dead trees. This accelerates the likelihood of extreme fires, even in our eastern forests, like the 2016 Great Smoky Mountains fire near Gatlinburg, Tennessee, that burned over 17,000 acres and killed 14 people during an exceptional drought. 
Within the boreal and Arctic regions of Alaska, climate change will increase lightning activity, will trigger a transition from boreal forests to more fire-prone grasslands, and will dry out peatlands, causing long-lasting underground fires that will span multiple fire seasons. Wildfires contribute to climate change by being a source of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. More frequent and intense wildfires now and in the future can potentially lower our forest ability to capture carbon by reducing forest density and tree size. Research into mitigating future wildfire risks should note that mitigating any wildfire risk means reducing carbon emissions and preventing further warming. Since we cannot prevent lightning strikes and, we, and as we work to limit warming, our remaining options are to reduce human-caused ignitions and to modify fuels. Human-caused ignitions in the Western US account for 84% of all wildfires. In a warmer and more flammable future, we must act to reduce arson, accidental fires, and the spread of open burning from agricultural fields to wildlands. And research in those areas will assist in those actions. Wildfire risk can be lowered through fuels reduction. This is most effectively done via prescribed burning, as well as working with indigenous fire practitioners to return cultural burning to the land. A community's tolerance for smoke will often dictate when or if a prescribed fire occurs, and social science research into the, those community reactions is needed. The choice is ours. Do we tolerate a few hours of smoke, or do we wait until we are forced to evacuate? Space-borne fire detections often rely on 375 meter to one kilometer resolution polar orbiting satellites, which are overhead two to four times per day, as Dr. Clements mentioned. A higher resolution sensor like the 30 meter Landsat is only overhead every 16 days, but the pixel sizes are about the size of a baseball diamond. Geostationary systems like NOAA's GOES R series have 0.5 to 2 kilometer pixels, so think 3 by 3 city blocks to 11 by 11 city blocks. But they capture images every 5 to 15 minutes. Improved wildland fire detection, monitoring, and research needs combined higher spatial and temporal resolution sensors. NOAA's GOXO gets us closer to, gets us closer to such a system. But the first launch is currently planned for the early 2030s. We need this now. Being able to see new fire ignitions and fire spread every 15 minutes within baseball sized, baseball diamond sized grids would be a game changer for science, for fire management and incident command, and for public education and engagement, including improved warning systems. Finally, I would be remiss not to mention as well the Joint Fire Science Program. The JFSP is a solutions-oriented federal research collaboration that provides scientific funding for practical results. But the JFSP also funds and manages the fire science exchange networks. These 15 regional fire science exchanges provide the most relevant and current wildland fire science to federal, tribal, state, local, and private stakeholders across all 50 states. Currently, the funding for and future of the JFSP and the regional exchanges is in question. We should not reinvent the wheel when a functioning and successful federal mechanism that collaborates with non-federal partners at all levels already exists. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to testify before you today, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you very much. We'll turn to our next wit witness, Mr. Geisler. We're looking forward to hearing from you. Good, man. Good morning, uh, Chairwoman Lofgren and Ranking Member Lucas and distinguished members of the committee. My name is George Geisler, State Forester and Deputy Wildland Fire and Forest Health for the Washington Department of Natural Resources. I'm past president of the National Association of State Foresters, chair of NASF's Wildland Fire Committee, and a member of the Wildland Fire Leadership Council. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today as the committee examines opportunities for further research and coordination related to wildland fire science. State forestry agencies such as DNR contribute a significant portion of the overall wildland fire suppression effort nationally in terms of resources, personnel, capacity, and funds. Each year, state and local agencies respond to the majority, roughly 80%, of all wildfires across all jurisdictions. And state foresters work closely with conservation districts, mayors, local and county governments, tribal and federal partners across the U.S., to deliver forestry programs and wildfire protection on a national scale. We appreciate the work of this committee to address this important issue 
And in the interest of time, I will highlight the following recommendations for improving research and development efforts focused on supporting wildland fire uh, management. First, please support research and development on wildland fire and behavior. I hear on like the coldest temperature. In the wildland fire. Whoever is behavior. unmuted, please mute. Wildland right. wildland now, wildland like now, modeling okay. would benefit wildland fire response efforts okay, and would be made involved. accessible to the general yeah. public. Yeah, we have good predictive I services have. now, but there is a clear need for real-time wildfire modeling at the operational level to inform response. As an example, the National Hurricane Center uses many models as guidance in the preparation of official track and intensity forecasts for hurricanes. Forecast models vary tremendously in structure and complexity. Similar tools would combine a collection or ensemble of wildfire models in real time to provide an advantage for wildland fire operations and better inform the public. Second, please support the development of fire simulation models that incorporate the built environment as a fuel. Currently, wildfire models encompass the wildlands and stop at the built environment to better determine future threats to communities in Malui. Trees and grasses burn very differently from homes and our businesses. Please support research and development that enables remote tracking of all active wildfire suppression resources in real time. Wildfire management and suppression operations utilize a patchwork of communication networks to track resources. We need to develop a standardized system for accountability and tracking of resources and develop an implementation schedule for integration of the system into the interagency environment. We need to improve the capacity for early detection and assessment of wildfires, particularly in rural areas. Oftentimes in many areas, including my own state of Washington, wildfires can go undetected for days. And we now rely more and more on citizens to report wildfires through typical 911 calls. More access to satellite technology and high performance infrared cameras would greatly improve early detection and assessment. And attacking wildfires early and when they're small is the key to reducing fatalities, industry, uh, injuries, loss of natural resource, property damage, and lowering our firefighting costs. Also, we ask you to prioritize the development of real time smoke modeling and decision support tools for wildland fire managers and local and regional public health officials. There are opportunities to leverage the resources of the EPA and Centers for Disease Control to better understand the public health impacts of smoke on people, including our wildland firefighters. With many wildfires occurring in the Louis, there are more materials and chemicals in homes and in the streets that burn and produce a very toxic environment. We ask you to provide research opportunities that will help inform the development and implementation of the next generation of national, state, and local codes and standards for addressing uh, WUI issues and catastrophic wildfire risk. This research should utilize the best available science and include the review of past wildfire losses. And finally, we ask you to develop a standard of warning scale for wildfires that actually conveys the magnitude or potential magnitude of current developing and projected wildfire events. This scale, much like the enhanced Fujita scale for tornadoes or the Richter scale for earthquakes, would help convey the magnitude of a threat to the public and could be used to improve evacuations and emergency preparations. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before the committee today on behalf of Washington's Department of Natural Resources and the National Association of State Foresters. Improvements in applied research and development technologies that support wildfire management will greatly enhance our collective ability to safely respond to wildfire and better protect our communities and treasured natural resources. I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now for our final witness, Chief Litzenberg, we'd be pleased to hear from you. Good morning, Chairwoman Johnson, Chairwoman Lofgren, and Ranking Member Lucas, as well as members of the committee. I am Eric Litzenberg, recently retired fire chief in the Santa Fe County Fire Department. I currently serve as chair of the Wildland Fire Policy Committee of the International Association of Fire Chiefs. I appreciate the opportunity today to discuss the state of federal wildland fire science in the future. Wildland fires are now an all year threat to every state. And as my previous panelists, as well as members of the committee have stated, the statistics continue to rise. This year probably looks to be the worst on record. Local fire departments are on the front lines. We prepare our communities for fires and are often the first to respond. We help evacuate communities when the fire is over. We help communities recover and address threats that often follow, such as flooding, debris flows, and landslides. 
While federal agencies like the US Forest Service and FEMA played the most visible role in responding to wildland fires, federal research agencies like NASA, NOAA, NIST, and NSF provide tools to help prevent and fight future wildland fires. They currently provide research and tools such as fire weather predictions, satellite imagery, predictive fire analysis, research in building codes and community fire prevention, post-fire analysis, and studies of major catastrophic fires and their aftermath. Greater federal research into satellites, climate and technology can revolutionize preparedness and response. As we adapt to new technology like unmanned aircraft systems, we can provide the incident commanders on scene with a host of new tools. Most importantly, we can develop an integrated picture. This will allow us to effectively save lives and property in the face of a growing wildland fire problem. As federal researchers focus on the national wildland fire problem, I'd like to highlight some emerging fields of research and technology for them to consider. Ground-based airborne and satellite remote sensing systems can provide an integrated early warning system and better picture of the incident. Satellites can identify fires in low density areas and near critical infrastructure. Also, remote sensing can be used to provide information about fuels and droughts. Fire mapping can be used to prevent and mitigate wildland fires. These maps can guide hazardous fuels and other mitigation projects. They also can provide real-time and interactive maps to assist incident commanders during a fire. Remote sensing data and risk maps can be used to provide predictive analytics. This information can be used to identify at-risk areas and focus community preparedness and mitigation efforts. UAS provides several capabilities. They can hover over a fire to track its progress. Infrared cameras can be used to identify hotspots and they can provide a wealth of real-time data to the firefighters in the field. The de development of a firefighter location tracking system would be a game changer. The creation of a practical firefighter tracking tool could improve firefighter safety and reduce the number of deaths and injuries that occur each year. The IFC recommends that the US Forest Service, FEMA, NOAA, and NIST work with the Wildland Fire Leadership Council to develop a standard warning system for wildland fires, much like the Richter scale for earthquakes. A standardized warning system would help emergency managers and the public act as the fire develops. Federal agencies should develop a standardized data collection system. This includes uniform formatting and methodology to capture and report wildland fire data, including information about mitigation, prevention, and post-recovery efforts. Effective communication systems are the glue that link all of these opportunities together. Unfortunately, we're still facing problems with coverage and interoperability. It will be crucial to address this problem to take advantage of the new tools under development. I would like to highlight FirstNet's role in focusing on building out a nationwide public safety broadband network. These capabilities offer potential, but they must be integrated effectively before incidents occur and on scenes. So the federal agencies should work with the Forest Service and Department of Interior, but they should also work with state, tribal, territorial, and local partners. There are opportunities like WIFLIC and NIFSI to have these discussions. In addition, they should work with non-governmental organizations such as the IFC. Prioritization of at-risk communities can guide community preparedness efforts like the IFC's Ready, Set, Go program. In addition, the National Fire Academy, IFC, and other educational and media organizations can partner with the federal researchers to get information and technology to the practitioners. The wildland fire problem is a national challenge. The IFC looks forward to working with the committee to mobilize our resources for this fight. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you very much for your testimony and to all the witnesses for your testimony. At this point, uh, we will uh, give members of the committee an opportunity to ask uh, questions of our witnesses for about five minutes, and I will begin uh, with myself. Um, you know, my constituents <clears throat> and the constituents of many of uh, us on this committee have been dealing with severe wildland or mega fires in recent years. And in fact, the wildland fires uh, has grown from a season to really all year round. Uh, we had fires in California in the winter. Um, and, you know, in a way I think about, yes, there are wildland fires, but they also impact urban areas. I'll never forget uh, visiting Santa Rosa in 2017, a little town, uh, not in the middle of a forest, 
and the fire came in and destroyed 5% of the housing in that a suburban community. It's going to a suburb and all the houses are gone. The shopping center is burned down. Uh, going you know, with uh, Representative uh, Thompson, who uh, represents that area to other areas of his district that just was was burned and and the the fire in paradise uh, uh, 2018 uh, Doug Lamalfa represents that area the fire swept through and the entire time town was also destroyed so uh, obviously uh, we have important steps to take uh, I'm interested in how we can enhance collaboration and coordination across the federal government along with you know, the operational stakeholders on the front line. So Dr. Clements and Dr. McCarty, as academic researchers who rely on federal data and resources, where should the federal investment in wildfire science be most urgently directed? First you, Dr. Clements. I thank you. So I think that funding these programs across all the, the agencies, particularly, I think what we really need to focus on is research focus so we can get better information in terms of better tools. And so having new tools will allow us to uh, build what we need in terms of sensor systems because we're lacking those sensor systems and also the fact that we need um, more platforms. Like was stated earlier, was the fact that we need better satellite technology. So I think an investment in a lot of s satellite development would be really beneficial to the entire wildfire science community. Dr. McCarty, do you have anything to add on that? I would just add that uh, we also need to think about as we develop these tools that we communicate them with the public in an effective way and, and, and we also integrate their input I think a lot of time when we think about wildfire risk and reducing wildfire risk, we forget that people are the main cause of fires still. And the, and the more that we are transparent and open with the public, the better they will understand the risk and potentially act as good citizens to reduce that risk in the future. And that includes uh, social science research, public health research, as was mentioned by some of the other uh, witnesses. Thank you. Are, are there opportunities for federal investment or direction that could have positive impacts in the short term? And how long do we think it will take for the longer term investments to have realized impacts? Dr. McCarty and then Dr. Clements. So for satellite development, these things take a while. NASA's decadal, decadal surveys are a decade long for a reason. Um, but oftentimes it's the funding and the priority that limits the advancement of these systems and implementation. And I agree also with um, federal investment in the Wildland, um, Wildland Fire Leadership Council would also be uh, needed so that it can interact with um, the incident command and the commanders on the field and, and NIFSI as well as um, other agencies. And that's a short term, you know, high, high risk, high reward um, investment that could be done quickly within um, an off season to see if that implements better in the next fire season. Dr. Clements, anything to add on that? I think uh, one thing that could happen quickly is if restoring the Joint Fire Science Program budget would allow researchers to just engage quickly because that program actually funds things faster than a lot of federal agencies. The timing between proposal submission and project start is really quick. And so that could be one way to just jumpstart a lot of research quickly. Uh, Dr. Uh, Mr. Geisler and Chief Litzenberg, I don't have much time left in my five minutes, but do you have anything to add to what's been said already? Uh, thank you. Uh, there is one statement I'd like to make, and, and I totally agree with the comments of my colleagues here on the panel. I would like to emphasize the application of that science also. There's a lot of really good work that's ongoing that will require just a little bit of funding and maybe increased collaboration between state, local, and federal agencies. And we can get this technology to the ground, to the firefighters where it's gonna make a difference. And so that, that interaction and collaboration I find is just something that we should foster and support as much as possible. Thanks. And, and I will add that echo for all three panelists and I'll emphasize what George Geisler just said about integration. There are places where this integration is already happening effectively. 
And as, as science and data is created, it'll be important to get this to the boots on the ground to the practitioners. And Wildland Fire Leadership Council and the Nas National Interagency Fire Center, that integration is happening already. So small investments can be leveraged um, significantly. Thank you very much. My time has expired. and I'd like to recognize the ranking member, Mr. Lucas. Thank you, Madam Chair. And George and I think we've worked together long enough. I can call you George. Uh, you mentioned your testimony about, uh, of course, listing several areas the, about how the committee could fill gaps and address shortfalls, and the chairwoman very appropriately went down that. Could you expand for a moment, thinking about from the committee's perspective, prioritizing those? Where particularly, George, if you had the ability to, to give us guidance, how would you prioritize one, two, three, four, if you don't mind? Uh, no, I'd be glad to. Thank you, Representative Lucas. And yes, you can call me George anytime. Uh, Thank you. The, uh, the, the priorities when we're looking at it, I mean, I am very aware of a lot of the satellite technology and some of the early work that's been going on. In fact, uh, in my time with Oklahoma Forest Service, we were working closely with the Severe Storms Lab, uh, doing early detection and, and notification modeling. And I know that while they, there's long-term uh, implications and development of the resource, currently there's a lot of opportunity just to get that on the ground right now, working with local agencies. The other piece that I would really like to emphasize is, is the firefighter and resource tracking. This is a safety issue and there are a number of different systems that are out there right now. And to be able to monitor and track our resources in real time ensuring that we are putting them in the best place as possible, ensuring that we're utilizing them effectively, and especially monitoring them to ensure that they are safe and that we are tracking and know that they're all going home. I think that that's just absolutely critical for us and, and we could make the changes that are necessary there. It's a standardization process and an implementation process that really needs to occur. And the last one though, for me is, is very much a, uh, I know that there's a lot of work here, but it, but it is something that I would sink my money into if I had to. And that's the discussion around real-time smoke modeling and continuing the, the decision space around that. Uh, smoke is probably the greatest public health issue related to wildland fire. And uh, knowing uh, what that uh, implications are, being able to work with the public to improve public health and firefighter health, in fact, I think is just a part of that mission. And, and the CDC and uh, EPA, along with uh, several other regional uh, smoke agencies, are doing some amazing work. And to kind of foster that even further would be a tremendous asset to us all. You know my district, George, literally from the northeast corner of the state to the southwest corner, the northwest half of Oklahoma. And weather forecasting is very critical to my farmers because it's decisions about when to plant, apply fertilizer, harvest, utilize prescribed burns to help maintain the health of our rangelands. And one of the ways that uh, my neighbors and my spouse uh, use, engage in decision making is using Oklahoma's mesonet system, which provides up to the minute uh, weather data. How did you utilize the mesonet data when you were state forester of Oklahoma? And along with that, while you're thinking about it, do you believe that such a system should be emulated in other states to help benefit, uh, prevent, and fight uh, large-scale wildfires? Yeah, the, the mesonet system that Oklahoma has is such a unique resource for firefighters. We can watch in almost real time weather ch pattern changes, wind changes. I remember distinctly my fire chief counting down a wind shift to people in the field, telling them when it was gonna occur and he hit it within a minute uh, because we were watching it all with the, on a screen. Uh, when I worked in other parts of the country, especially if you go to places like here in Washington state, we struggle because there's so many microclimates and not enough monitors. And But to be able to do that, to be able to talk to folks in real time and do the prediction that uh, folks that have all of that data, like the Mesonet, that what the Mesonet system provides uh, was just unbelievably valuable to us in that environment, especially an environment that the type of fuels Oklahoma has, it's a rapidly changing fire scenario. They're very quick, fine fuels, and you have to know the wind very, very uh, effectively to do it. 
in other parts of the country, when I got get out, I, I do sometimes wax nostalgia about uh, Mesonet and having that, something to that effect across the United States would be amazing. And uh, I think fire any fire manager that works in Oklahoma uh, is always thrilled by the app that we can easily download on our phones and do all of that. So it's an excellent tool. I agree. Absolutely. The, the, the ability to protect uh, both uh, citizens' lives and their property and I know there have been many occasions, as you've kind of alluded to, when volunteer fire lines members have been moved in a hurry because they couldn't survive where they were. An amazing system. With that, uh, thank you, George, and I yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. The gentlelady from Oregon is now recognized, Ms. Bonamici. Uh, thank you so much, Chair Lofgren, and thank you to Chair Johnson and Ranking Member Lucas for holding this hearing today, but especially thank you to our witnesses uh, for bringing your expertise. I, I represent Northwest Oregon, and this past weekend, the Pacific Northwest faced a record-breaking heat wave with temperatures exceeding 100 degrees for multiple days. In fact, it was 115 degrees at home yesterday. These dangerous temperatures combined with a thin snowpack and below average precipitation uh, are really raising alarms about our upcoming wildfire season. In fact, we have already seen a 6,200 acre fire on the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs Reservation in Central Oregon. Fortunately, um, it's been mostly contained, but Oregonians have become all too familiar with wildfires in recent years. Over Labor Day weekend just last year, rare powerful winds and very dry conditions resulted in unprecedented wildfires across the state. Approximately a million acres burned. Lives were lost, homes and communities were destroyed. Hazy skies and smoky conditions made the air quality in Portland comparable to some of the most polluted places on the planet. Thank you, Mr. Geiser, for highlighting the health hazards of smoke. Uh, our communities are really on the front lines of the climate crisis, and wildfires are yet another example of the need for comprehensive and bold uh, climate action. So I want to ask you, Dr. Clements, you said we need to treat wildfires like other natural disasters and severe weather threats. And in your testimony, you noted the deficiencies in our understanding of how wildfires create their own weather and how fire atmospheric interactions can affect spread. So how would improving our understanding of fire weather help to mitigate or respond to wildfires and how can Congress better direct federal agencies to conduct this important research? Thank you. So yeah, the fire weather gap, a knowledge gap is really a, a, is a problem because we just don't put those resources to fire weather like I mentioned thinking about the hurricane hunters. We don't have those resources for fire. Now we have um, suppression resources at very, you know, tons of suppression resources. One thing we can do is we can instrument suppression aircraft with these tools, with the science tools. I've been uh, advocating this in, for a while now and it wouldn't be that hard because everything would be automated and we could actually just get all the information in real time. So harnessing the current uh, platforms that are surrounding fires is really important. And I think what, what we're missing is that we can't, you know, when we go to, so for example, my team, we go to active wildfires in California with Doppler radar, Doppler LIDAR, and we're the only team in the U.S. that can do that. There are no observations on active wildfires. It's not like there's storm chasers chasing fires. We're the, the small team and we get just a little bit of information here and there. We need to change that, um, that concept and make it more of a priority where we're actually supporting the incident meteorologists of the National Weather Service on these, on these uh, big fires. In addition, I think we could support, funding could be directed to NOAA for this type of uh, infrastructure to support the incident meteorologists. You know, they're tasked with uh, forecasting very high resolution using models, but they don't have the observations on the fire. And some of these fires are so remote that we don't have the observations. Thank uh, you, that's how, really helpful. You know, I don't wanna cut you off, but I wanna to try to get in another question. Thank you so much. Right. I wanna ask Chief Litzenberg, last year I joined my colleagues on the Select Committee on the Climate Crisis in releasing our bold science-based uh, plan to reach net zero emissions no later than mid-century and net negative thereafter. The plan represents the first significant legislative proposal to address the need for climate resilience investments, including investing in wildfire risk mapping systems that integrate relevant data from federal agencies, states, and partners. So 
in your testimony, you noted uh, the importance of risk mapping and real-time interactive maps. So what are the implications of the expansion of the wildland urban interface without high-resolution mapping? And how could better maps, including parcel-level data, better inform planning and response decisions? Um, thank you for that question, Congressman. So that, that is the key to what we do, um, getting good data, and, and putting it in a, in a way that's usable, not only to our responders, uh, but to those in the community who are working on the team that's doing prevention, doing mitigation, trying to make our communities safer. And as we have seen hotter, drier conditions, the risk areas have expanded. Um, I will say that, and I said it in my testimony as well, one of the keys to, to me and my profession and uh, my representation as a responder is that that data becomes available as real time as possible to, to those that are on the ground doing the work. So there's application in both uh, prevention and mitigation and predictive analysis and uh, incident command and real time situational awareness. Thank you so much. My time has expired. I yield back. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Posey is now recognized. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I Really appreciate you having a hearing on this. Uh, Mr. Geisler, the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences issued a report entitled Human Presence Diminishes the Importance of Climate in Driving Fire Activity Across the United States. Uh, this report is significant because it found that climate was significantly less important where humans were more prevalent, suggesting that human influence could override or even exceed the effect of climate change on fire activity. And, and Madam Chair, I'd ask uh, unanimous consent to submit this report for the record. Without objection. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, based on your experience uh, to prevent fires, uh, should our limited resources be focused more or specifically on what and how uh, we are building in fire zones rather than uh, the broader topic of climate change? Mr. Geisler, I appreciate your response. Thank you, Congressman. I appreciate that. Uh, actually, the when we talk about fire and fire prevention, uh, I, one of the earlier panelists mentioned the greatest numbers of fires are caused by humans, uh, whether it be a spark or, or a campfire. Uh, we use the old Smokey Bear message of only you. Uh, bottom line, though, is, is with development in ur wild and urban areas, uh, we're getting more people, and so you have more opportunities for fires to occur. It's not that they're not trying to prevent it, but it's just greater opportunities. In fact, in my own state of Washington, the west side, while uh, it, it does have forests that typically have a longer duration between fires because of the fuels types, that's where our biggest population is, and we are seeing significant fires there. Uh, but at the same time, if you look at our forests and our forest resiliency, climate has had an impact on that also. And so combining with their both uh, challenges, that's why a lot of what you see happening right now is an emphasis on working towards uh, healthier forests, greater uh, resiliency in those forests and making them more for adapt fire adapted. So for me, it's really a two prong approach. There is the long term of we have to get our fuel situation under control. We have to be able to keep our landscapes resilient, whether it's a forest or a, or a rangeland. But at the same time, there's an education process and a prevention process, which we have to get people to be aware of what they're doing, be able to prevent those fires. And then in our planning efforts, as people move into these beautiful areas, we have to get those areas better prepared for the interactions of the fires that will inevitably come. And I lost sound. I, can, you, can you hear us? I cannot hear you anymore. I cannot hear the, the congressman. How about that? Is this better? That's better, sir. Thank you. Uh, I, I'm asking if uh, you'd be kind enough to explain uh, why we need to include our, quote, built communities, those where we have built homes, roads, businesses, and schools in fire simulation models. Uh, easily, because 
as we see the the roads and the the homes being put into these areas our models currently just look at it as a continuous layer of fuels basically we look at it as trees and grasses uh, homes and businesses structures all of these things change the fire behavior change the the way that fire acts on the landscape having that information knowing how the reaction of the fire is going to be or the the, the actual behavior of the fire is going to be when it hits these communities is something that will better inform our firefighters and make them work safer and be able to suppress the, the fires a lot easier. Very good. Uh, thank you, Mr. Geisler. Uh, Madam Chair, I see my time is about to expire. I yield back. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Barra of California is now recognized. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman and um, the ranking member. <clears throat> Obviously, this is a hugely important issue for us in California. If I think about why I love the state of California, you know, from hiking in the backcountry as a Boy Scout when I was growing up to, you know, hiking in the Sierra Nevadas and, you know, the Feather River, et cetera, camping out there. A lot of those places have um, experienced and are now scarred by forest fires. And, you know, I'm going to ask a, a series of questions and I'd, I'd ask the witnesses to keep their answers um, short and tight so I can get through a number of these. I want to make sure I understand, you know, on the sensing side of this, you know, I've, I've heard a number of the witnesses talk about how we just haven't allocated the satellite resources necessary, because I don't think it's a technology issue. I think, you know, we have infrared sensing devices, we have the ability to put satellites in space, so they're constantly monitor monitoring areas 24-7. We have drone capabilities that could you know, surveil, you know, these areas. So it's, I, I want to make sure I understand it. It's not a technology issue. It's a resource allocation issue, if, if I get that correct. And, and maybe Mr. Clements, is that, you know, an accurate sense? Yeah, so let's, we can use CAL FIRE as an example. CAL FIRE has adopted the latest uh, science and um, software package available, and it allows to track resources, firefighters, it puts the fire prediction model in there. And so it's the state of the science and it's actually been very successful. So that information gets um, some DOD satellite uh, fire guard data involved uh, so they can map it. But those data aren't really applied to the research community. But yes, the resources, it's the resource issue. CAL FIRE has already adopted it and it's very successful. They have a new system It's uh, for the whole state and it's a really good model that should be used nationally. Great, right, fantastic. So I think that's something we as a committee could work on in a bipartisan way. A question for Mr. Geisler, you know, one area that I've worked on over the years is we have allocated resources to better forestry management, et cetera. But for years, we would do this thing called fire borrowing, where we would take those resources and then we'd actually spend them to fight the fires. I know we've tried to address the issue of fire borrowing, um, I suspect we could do more on the forestry management side to mitigate um, some of these, these forest fires. Is that correct? Uh, yes, sir. The, the fire borrowing issue was actually uh, helped tremendously by some legislation that occurred a couple of years ago. Uh, really, the, the emphasis right now needs to be to take that, those dollars and really force them onto the ground and making sure that they are being put into the highest priority areas that we have. Uh, a lot of times uh, when we're doing forest management, I call them random acts of conservation, uh, where a lot of it is kind of spread across the landscape and prioritizing the funds, making sure that they get to the ground is something that we should all emphasize and, and work harder on. Okay, great. And again, we were able to pass that, that legislation in a bipartisan way. So I think this is another area where we could work together as Democrats and Republicans you know, to, to really make sure we're actively managing our forests and mitigating some of these fires. Um, Mr. Litzenberg, let me ask you a question that, you know, four or five years ago, I had two of my local fire chiefs, you know, who happened to be up in Washington, D.C. visiting. And, you know, just serendipitously, they started talking about the stresses that we're putting on our, our firefighters. And, you know, since then, I've talked to a number of, I, I represent a suburban urban community, but a lot of our firefighters rotate up into the hills to, to supplement Cal Fire and, and help with these fires. So they're almost constantly working during fire season. And you know, we put together a piece of legislation called the HEROES Act a, a, a few years ago, which is passed out of the House in this Congress, really identifying and trying to address the pressures and stress 
that uh, are leading to firefighter suicide, firefighter PTSD, et cetera. Um, you know, if you could you know, just quickly comment on the stresses that the men and women um, are under, both urban and suburban, but also the folks that are in the forestry service. Congressman, I really appreciate that question because yeah, the stresses on our workforces at any level, all levels of government and um, private sector are significant and they are a full range from behavioral stressors uh, all the way through physical stressors. The more that you ask from a workforce that's already strapped, the longer you ask them to serve in terms of hours in a day or in terms of weeks and months in a year. And the more exposures you give them to smoke and to human suffering, the greater stressors they have. So we, we've always appreciated investments in, in solutions, but we are only just beginning to discover the effects that um, these stresses have on our response force. They are significant. Well, great. And we've passed that legislation out of the House in a bipartisan way. Let's hope the Senate takes it up and sends it to the president's desk. Thank you. And with that, I'll give it back. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Kim of California is now recognized. Thank you, Chair Lohsgren and Ranking Member Lucas for holding this hearing. I want to thank the witnesses for being with us today, too. You know, unfortunately, uh, wildfires in my district and the rest of California, where Congressman Anibera and I are from, we seem to be more prevalent every year. Uh, and with 85% of California in extreme droughts, the problem of longer wildfire seasons has been exacerbated by the dryness of our landscape and the record-breaking temperatures. And adding insult to injury, the wildfire smoke and ash negatively impact our air quality and drinking water. And I hope we can work in a bipartisan manner to better coordinate our federal efforts in predicting wildfires and adopt cutting edge solutions to detect fires as soon as they start. Uh, Mr. Geisler, you know, I represent California's 39th district where we have unfortunately seen the devastating effects of wildfires, not only in my community, but across the state of California. So how can we ensure coordination between federal, state, and local communities to share available information and tools to better predict and respond to wildfires? Thank you for that question, Congresswoman. I appreciate it. Uh, the one thing that I will emphasize is, is that you really should be proud of the national system and that we do have currently. Uh, the, the interaction that we have between federal, state, and local agencies is, is something that actually other countries come to try to duplicate. Uh, but there's always room for improvement. Uh, getting to common operating systems, being able to share data, being able to share and communicate effectively is really some of the items that if we can address those, uh, it is, it's critical. A lot of times it's just the difference between two computer systems or, or uh, uh, literally the links that we might be able to get through broadband that prevents some of the sharing. And so it sounds kind of, kind of basic, uh, that the need, but the willingness and the ability to do it is there. A lot of times it is just making sure that the connections are made, whether it be introducing two people, literally just doing that, all the way to making sure that our systems link together and operate effectively. The, the system that was just described that Cal Fire had is absolutely amazing. And it's in test and it has been doing some uh, great work. Part of the basis of that is its ability to start communicating across jurisdictional authorities. And that's what we're all looking for, is that ability to effectively share all of these resources that we currently have. You know, so uh, NOAA has commenced the process of designing the next generation of satellites in its fleet. So I have any of your colleagues engaged with NOAA in designing these satellites to improve Wi-Fi detection ability. If not, what advice would you give to NOAA to help make the future satellite fleet uh, more effective in Wi-Fi detection and prevention? So I, I will say that I am unaware if any of my colleagues have work directly with NOAA over satellites. I will tell you that in my past life, uh, I was able to work with the National Severe Storm Labs in Norman, uh, Oklahoma. And I know that the interaction between the National Weather Service and state agencies is very strong. And we utilize a lot of that satellite technology and that there have been conversations about how effectively those could be used at the NOAA level also. But I'm unaware of anyone that is speaking directly to them. But I do agree it's it's a huge opportunity for us all. 
So you're familiar with the uh, the experimental uh, high resolution rapid refresh smoke model. Yeah. Yes. Have you had input on that development of any of these models? And in your opinion, what further research and development is needed to make existing models more effective? Yeah, a lot of input has been really coordinated through the Wildland Fire Leadership Council, where we do have all of the partners at the table. Uh, so you not only have state foresters, but you also have mayors and, and other members of the, of the various uh, levels of government uh, really having those discussions. So it's, it's a really powerful uh, uh, forum to kind of discuss the needs and where we go forward. Uh, so going into the future, we're lo really looking again to try to enforce that and try to um, get more of the outreach. Uh, there's a very recent uh, memo even, in fact, between CDC and EPA discussing wildfire smoke and actually being able to address all of the research and coordination that was there. And all of that was, was actually uh, made possible through the interactions that we've had at that Wildland Fire Leadership Council. So again, I, it sounds like I'm a broken record related to uh, potentially solving a lot of these problems, but there's basic funding we need for research. But then there's also just the social science of communication and then effectively making sure that we share resources across the table. Thank you very much. I see my time is up, so I yield back. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Stevens is now recognized. Thank you, uh, Chair Lofgren, uh, for presiding over today's hearing, and thank you to our witnesses um, for your incredible written, written and spoken testimony. Your, your written testimonies in particular were quite inspiring, and I, I really enjoyed re reading them. Um, in Michigan, uh, during this month alone, the National Weather Service has issued multiple red flag fire warnings uh, throughout the state. And, uh, and in particular, last year, we saw fire outbreaks in northern Michigan. And Dr. Clements, in your testimony, you focused on programs that are aimed at fire weather research and wildfire uh, prediction. Could you tell me more about the types of climate smart investments in research that are needed for better, uh, for us to better understand the influences of wildfire on weather and vice versa? Yeah, thank you, Congresswoman, for the question. I think uh, one focus, what I mentioned earlier, would be this coupled fire atmosphere modeling tool because it's the only tool that actually allows the atmosphere to drive the fire and then the fire itself to drive the atmosphere. And that's where we get our most dangerous fires is when we have big plumes and you can't predict where that fire is gonna go. So investment into high resolution coupled fire atmosphere models is critical. Uh, and like I mentioned earlier, it's used in, um, so Greece, it's their national model. They have already adopted it. Uh, National Center for Atmospheric Research is also building on that model. So these are the kind of tools I think that we really need to invest in. In addition, it also predicts smoke at very high resolution. And so you can tell a community what the smoke concentration is going to be in an hour, tomorrow, or the next day. So that's where I would really focus a lot of investment in terms of model. Well, and do you have recommendations or uh, any examples that you know of, of how the, the federal government is working across agencies to forecast and predict these fires and better inform and protect the, the public? Well, yeah. It was, so in terms of national, we have the National Fire Danger Rating System, which allows us to understand what the fire risk is. And so that goes across the nation. That's a U.S. Forest Service product. But it needs to be a little bit more higher resolution in terms of forecasting certain areas. Um, for fire behavior research, it's it's agency specific. We don't really have a fire behavior prediction system at a national level. You're muted. I muted myself. Okay. And then an, another uh, major priority for, for many of us, including my, myself on this committee, um, has been the effort to strengthen our STEM pipeline uh, to ensure that we have trained scientists and engineers who are ready to help address the 21st century challenges uh, that are before us. And um, Dr. McCarthy and Dr. Clements, are there skills from the fire management side of this work that you believe would benefit the STEM workforce or, or relate to activities with STEM workforce training? 
And how would you recommend those skills to be transferred? Sure. Uh, I'll, I'll begin with that. So I'm, I'm not from Ohio. I'm actually from Eastern Kentucky. And funnily enough, I'm married to a man from Michigan. My daughter was born in the UP. So I know a lot about um, Appalachian Eastern Forest Fire, interval, fire Return Interval Fire Regimes. But I started actually as an undergrad working for the Daniel Boone National Forest and learned a lot of technical skills. Um, and as a first generation student, that was really important for me as a pipeline into graduate school at the University of Maryland to have that applied um, workforce working on fire risk modeling um, within an Eastern Forest because of Southern pine beetle infestation. And that was one of the reasons that I was able to get a graduate assistantship um, from a small school in Appalachia was because I had worked on these types of on the ground management, STEM uh, skills and computing and data science. And so I didn't come from a, you know, a very prestigious, prestigious undergraduate institution, though it is great. Um, and so that helped me in that pipeline. So I do think that uh, throughout holistically the wildfire science community, this is a good way to get anyone from anywhere uh, you know, whether they're, you know, a, a woman or a man, uh, non-binary, to get involved because we are welcome. This is a problem, you know, across all 50 states and, and solutions. So I would just say that and turn it over to Dr. Clement. Real quick. Um, so yeah, at San Jose State, we created a new wildfire sciences minor. And so that'll allow us to bring students from a diverse background into our field to give them some tool sets that they can take to like their, if they're a business major, if they're a psychology major, they'll be aware of the wildfire problem. In addition to fire weather training, that is very critical for meteorologists to have, which is something that we're also doing and is a need around the nation. Thank you. The gentlelady's time has expired, and we'll turn now to Mr. Feenstra. Thank you, uh, Chairman Lofgren and Ranking Member Lucas, and thank you to our, all our witnesses for your testimony and sharing your extensive research and your experience with us. This question is for uh, Mr. Uh, Geisler. In 2020, Iowa experienced 126 wildfire incidents that burned almost 2,200 acres. These fires can jump from burning grasslands to agricultural fields, reaping financial devastation uh, for our farmers. What is the current state of understanding as to how, how a forest or grass-based wildfire interacts with spreads across agricultural land? What research questions remain to be answered in this domain? Thank you, Congressman, for that question. Uh, there is a lot of uh, work that is actually ongoing relative to the interaction between agricultural croplands and wildland fire. Uh, for most wildland fire managers, uh, we actually utilize a lot of agricultural croplands because at certain times they are the most irrigated spots on the planet and we are able to use them in forest fire control. But as you know, and, and others on the committee know, at various stages of the crop cycle, uh, you're going to have conditions where crops can be damaged or that the fuels that are remaining on the ground can carry a wildfire. Uh, so basically a lot of the types of fuels that we're seeing on the ground do fit within some of our existing models. They need to be fine tuned somewhat to as far as the local conditions and a lot of the local agencies do some of that work in a house just to correlate the types of agricultural crops that they're currently seeing on the ground relative to the standard fuels models that we that we have. Uh, but there is probably some ongoing work that could happen there, uh, and especially where it comes into crop protection going forward. Yeah, thank you. And I've seen that a lot with our corn crop in the fall and soybeans when we're ready to harvest and a spark, uh, you know, sets set off by a combine or whatever, and we have a lot of devastation. I have one other question for you. Iowa is also home to numerous lakes and rivers, which are important for recreation, economic activities for my constituents. When discussing wildfires, we common, commonly focus on the damage uh, and destruction due to the flames and vegetation and to the man-made infrastructures. However, I'd like to ask, what consequences can high-intensity and high-heat wildfires have on watersheds, and what additional research do we need to better understand uh, these impacts? I'm actually very glad you brought that one up. Uh, 
post-fire recovery is something that a lot of us within the Wildland Fire Leadership Council and within the community are really looking to how do we better do a job, do a better job of this. Uh, right now, if you look at resources that are available, uh, the Forest Service does have what they call burn area response units or bear teams uh, that can evaluate and look to those areas to determine what are going to be the impacts, how do we recover. More specifically, a lot of that re revolves around impacts to water quality as well as vegetation recovery. Uh, the resources available at the state and local level are very limited. And in fact, uh, in most cases, uh, a lot of that does not get done. But when you have the effects of a catastrophic wildfire or one that removes a significant portion of the vegetation, obviously that's gonna have an impact on water quality uh, downstream. And so the, the idea of what we need to do, how we address it is all being discussed right now. I know that the uh, national uh, uh, sciences groups are actually coordinating through USGS and others. We're trying to come to a better way to effectively uh, address these issues following some of these fires. And it does not matter if you're working in a, in a mountainous terrain where a lot of people think it is more significant or, or more visible, I should say. Uh, but on all aspects of watersheds, if you have these kind of damaging fires, uh, you can impact the water quality. Yeah, I, I, I really appreciate that information. Uh, we see that in Iowa quite a bit, where all of a sudden you have, you know, the buffer strip gets gets burned away, and all of a sudden you have significant erosion. And there's really not a lot to stop that until the next spring, until the grass grows back or vegetation grows back. So, you know, it's always a concern for me. So I, I thank you for your, your uh, responses, and I thank you to all the, the uh, uh, testimony of each one of you, and I yield my time back. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Stansbury is now recognized. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, and thank you so much for holding this important hearing this morning. I also want to thank especially Chief Litzenberg for being here this morning from Santa Fe County, which is from my home state in New Mexico. Thank you for your service and to all of our local state, county, federal and tribal firefighters. Thank you for your work on the front lines protecting our communities. Um, and I also want to thank you for sharing your expertise this morning. So I think it goes without saying that addressing wildfire is not only a matter of protecting our public safety and the ecological well-being of our forests and our communities, but in New Mexico, it's also a matter of national security because a significant number of our forest lands also abut on our national laboratories and our federal military installations as well. But it's also the single largest threat to water and drought resilience in New Mexico and much of the West as well, um, as well as our future climate adaptation and economic security. And as was noted by Chief Litzenberg's uh, testimony, we're already spending billions of dollars a year at the federal and local and tribal level levels to both suppress fire and fight fires across the West. Um, so one of the things that I wanted to talk a little bit about today is our forest science. So we've focused a lot here today on remote sensing, fire weather, warning systems and hazards. But um, one of the most significant and important ways that we can address and mitigate the catastrophic fires that are affecting the West is through forest management. And this is especially true in New Mexico where a lot of really exciting climate and forest management science is happening. So um, we're seeing a lot of really incredible partnerships between our tribes and pueblos, our local county officials, nonprofit organizations like the Nature Conservancy, our national laboratories, who are doing really um, exciting complex modeling around forest dynamics, carbon sequestration, soil, um, and ways in which we can actually target our forest treatments. And in fact, one of the things that's most exciting to me about having Chief Litzenberg here this morning is that he was intimately involved in these activities in what is called the Santa Fe Fireshed Program, which is a collaborative of all of these different programs. And so my question is actually for our chief, um, Mr. Litzenberg, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the Santa Fe Fireshed um, efforts and share with us us, how the science was leveraged and partnerships were leveraged and how we might scale this exciting collaborative model across the West. I sure can, Congresswoman, and, and um, again, very, very much appreciate uh, that question because it is, 
near and very dear to me. Um, the Santa Fe, the Greater Santa Fe Fireship Coalition is a very successful collaboration. And it was built from the ground up around the premise that if you bring the right people to the table, much like you have, I think, on this panel, um, who can put their two cents into the mix, you often get a product that's much better than a single person or a single organization could have, uh, could have come up with. And in that coalition, we have all levels of government. We have nonprofit, we have scientists, we have people from the labs, uh, and we even have people who don't necessarily agree with what we're doing. And we had regular meetings to talk about how do we make our watershed and our forests healthier and safer and ultimately protect our communities, uh, both for recreation, um, for, for life safety, and, and prevent the large fires and, and those things that occur. We've talked about the smoke, we've talked about the post-fire debris, um, they've got huge destructive um, potential uh, to, to not only um, primary effects, but secondary and tertiary effects. And anything you can do to, to research and create data on, on those things that are modifiable and toss them into a room where smart minds can think together and come up with solutions, much like the Santa Fe Fireshed Coalition, uh, I, I think replication of that across the West and the nation is uh, much in order. Thanks for asking that question. Thank you, Chief Witzenberg, and I would really encourage my colleagues, I know many in the fire community are very familiar with these efforts in New Mexico, but it's a really exciting model in the real grand watershed efforts that are being put into restoring our forests are really a model for the nation. And finally, I just want to say that there's a coupled opportunity while we're talking about fire mitigation to talk about carbon sequestration. A recent study by the um, Climate Alliance um, in New Mexico showed that reforestation of burned catastrophic fire areas has a huge potential to help capture carbon. Carbon. So um, I really think that that's an important part of the science that we need to be introducing into the conversation. And with that, Madam Chairwoman, I yield back. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, now the gentleman from California, Mr. Obonotti, is uh, recognized. Thank you very much, Madam Chairman, and thank you to all of our panelists. Uh, I represent a very fire prone and very rural section of the Western United States. And so the uh, prevention of these wildfires is of critical importance to the people that I represent. And I know a lot of the people in this room uh, share that concern. Uh, I, uh, one of the things that I was struck by in the testimony from all four of our witnesses is the inadequacy of the uh, current satellite data that we're getting. Uh, both in terms of geospatial resolution and in terms of temporal resolution. And, and frankly, I had no idea that it was still this bad that, to be talking about uh, geospatial resolution of a, of a kilometer and temporal re resolution of only one or two frames per day uh, is, is clearly not going to be adequate to generate the kind of uh, wildfire models that we need to predict wildfire behavior and certainly is not going to be uh, as useful as it could be to uh, to be able to uh, give early warning when new wildfires start. So uh, that's what I'd like to ask some questions about, and uh, I, I probably could pick any of the panelists, but uh, Dr. McCarty, uh, I was struck by your testimony about this. I, can you talk a little bit about what the prospects are for improved uh, satellite imaging, uh, if we have anything in the pipeline, and in particular maybe talk about the fact that I, I know that you know we're talking about geo space. Um, uh, uh, we're talking about geostationary satellites mostly here, but you know the state of the art in satellites now is low Earth orbit satellites, which might solve your your uh, spatial resolution problems. Also, is there some prospect that we could use some of the assets that we have to solve this problem? Yes, and I thank you, Congressman, for that question. I, I do think that we have a lot of work going on uh, at NASA, at NOAA. I know uh, NIST even had um, a small workshop about around this. Um, a few years ago, um, of data fusion, of thinking about how to, um, uh, inter, you know, intercorporate um, various polar orbiting satellites, including low Earth orbit and some of our commercial um, platforms, um, as well as our open source um, geostationary, uh, to provide better um, temporal resolution. Uh, it's more complicated with spatial resolution be because um, you just kind of have to accept the data as it is, how it was engineered. If it was engineered at 10, at 10 kilometers, it's 10 kilometers. And you just have to take that location and then try to compare it to something that's 10 meters 
in resolution. We've also had um, in the last 10 years and, and you know, much credit to NASA, USGS and NOAA for uh, their collaboration with the European Space Agency, um, with the Indian Space Agency, with the Japanese Space Agency and trying to um, improve some of our other collaborations so that we have open source access to their platforms and are developing, uh, you know, kind of a cross pollination and coordination. And to be fair, sometimes our satellite systems are developed because they are meeting the needs of the community and not just the fire community. Often they need to meet the agriculture and food security. They need to meet uh, biodiversity and forest management. Um, they need to think about water quality um, as well as the atmospheres and the lith lithosphere as well. And so sometimes what we need for fire will get maybe pushed uh, to the end or, or um, at least the resolution will be downgraded a bit um, bec because there are these other components that also need to be captured in the same platform. Um, and so I do think that NOAA's uh, GOXO, which is in collaboration with NASA, is one way to move forward. They did hold a, a workshop last summer with local, state, and federal level fire researchers and practitioners and management to get their input on that. But, but even that system, which was um, a con an RFP was issued and two um, contractors were selected earlier this spring, its highest resolution will be half a kilometer. Um, and so really we need to think about, um, you know, setting an agenda where the, we want spatial resolution that is helpful both tactically and strategically um, for, for fire management. And if I, I will return um, to you for if you have further questions. Well, uh, thank you. I completely agree. It, it, uh, I'm, I'm horrified that we don't have access to higher resolution data than that. And as a scientist myself, I can tell you there, there's, uh, there's no way you can, uh, you can uh, create meaningful prediction models based on that. And as you say, it would be very, uh, we, we've got all of these high speed aerial assets now for fighting the fires. It'd be very helpful to be able to have real time information about when the fires start and where. So uh, I'm hopeful that we in Congress can help you uh, to, to solve this problem and get access to this uh, higher resolution data because then we can, as you say, text and take the next step, work with the National Science Foundation and uh, catalyze some more research into this topic. But uh, I see my time's expired. Uh, I want to thank you uh, to all of our panelists and I uh, yield back, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you. Dr. Foster is recognized. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Dr. Clements, uh, in your testimony, you stated your team has deployed to nearly 40 wildfires in California with specialized equipment, including mobile Doppler, LIDAR, and radar assets, and that these tools have provided a lot of insights into the dynamic of, of plume-dominated wildfires and, and how the fires in the atmosphere interact with each other on a large scale. Um, you know, back in my district in Illinois, uh, uh, last week we had uh, some... <laughs> some tornadoes, and it was amazing when you looked at the data that was available in real time for, uh, from LIDAR system and Doppler radar, that my wife and I basically, you know, came to a, got into a safe area, turned on the TV, and we could watch the tornado vortex as it moved across neighborhoods just south of my house. And so I was wondering, you know, I'm very interested in the technological developments in sensors, and particularly cost reduction, uh, that would really help us have a much higher density of sensors on there. And so in regards to that, um, you know, roughly the equipment that you deploy, how much does it cost if you just had to buy another one of those? Thank you for your question, Congressman. So the, the, the radar is a special radar. It's a K band. It's custom made. It's not that expensive. It's about six hundred, seven hundred thousand dollars. Okay. Not including the truck and all that stuff. And that's probably a relatively low cost, uh, high resolution Doppler radar. The lidars are even less expensive. They're about three hundred fifty thousand dollars. And so, you know, these aren't super expensive uh, instruments. But to set up a network of those, it, it would be somewhat costly. Now. The advantage of also the LIDAR is it allows us to look at vertical wind profiles, which is really critical in downslope wind storms and understanding the onset of uh, critical winds for fire weather, particularly in California with the uh, public safety power shutoffs. And so there's a need for those. Um, just to get back to the surface weather station uh, discussion, California has more surface weather stations than any other place on the planet because of the utilities. They've invested a lot into um, meteorological data for their modeling. And so I think we can 
down, get the costs down if we build more instruments, or we can use uh, new engineering technologies to, to build these instruments better and cheaper. So there is a way to use it. In addition, we also have the National uh, Radar Network, for the NOAA Radar Network that we use for wildfire uh, observations as well. So there's a lot of things that we can do. Yeah, I think one of the things we have to get better at as a nation is making high-tech stuff cheaper in large quantity. And I think you might be able to bootstrap this if there was just an agreement that we're going to deploy, deploy you know, hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of equipment like you, like you deploy um, all over the country. And you might find the cost curve goes down pretty sharply. Uh, is there a consensus on the types of data points and the collection assets that you'd like? You, know, you mentioned ground-based stations. You, know, you can imagine drone swarms that come in over, over fires, uh, maybe just uh, more investment in satellites, um, or maybe more investment in just the, the inventories of all the consumables that are on the ground. Uh, is there an agreement on what you'd really like, or is that still something that's under discussion? Well, I think in terms of the fire weather community, we're probably in agreement that we need more atmospheric observations, but then we also need to understand what the fire is doing at every instant. Uh, one technology that's coming out is small radars that are cheaper that you can put on uh, power poles or uh, utility assets. So that way you can scan everything versus just the national radar network. So using smaller radars that are getting uh, more cost effective could be a really good asset in the future. All right. And um, could someone say a little bit about the collaboration, the state of collaboration, particularly with DOD? You know, I don't think I'm giving away any national security secrets to, to say that we spend a lot of time looking for infrared flares uh, for various purposes. And um, so I was wondering, do you, do you hit a roadblock where you say, well, you know, we could give you information, but then we don't want the bad guys to know we have this capability, so we won't tell you? Or is there really a pretty good collaboration in real time when there's a serious fire hazard? Well, I, I guess I could take that for my knowledge. What I know is that there's a fire guard uh, product that uh, maps the fire in real time for fire agencies. Those data are not publicly available, but uh, the technology is, is there. So, um, you know, increasing that uh, collaboration could be very useful, or using that technology in a more public uh, framework would be a beneficial to the research community. Okay, that sounds like it could be a job for Congress. Uh, the other possible collaboration might be insurance companies. Uh, did they look at detailed fire modeling uh, to come up with their insurance rates on rates on a house by house level? Are they big players in this? Yeah, we're working with some insurance companies now, as well as the utilities. I mean, there's so much investment needed in in a better understanding of the fire problem, and so insurance companies are definitely interested in the risk for sure. Okay, thank you. My time is up, and to yield back. Uh, thank you. Mr. Webster is recognized. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for holding this meeting. Uh, Chief Litzenberg, I had a question about, you, you mentioned some items or fields of future focus uh, in, your, in your report and uh, kind of things like remote sensing or or uh, fire mapping, things like that. Which of those would be the highest priority? Congressman, thanks for that question. Um, it is a tough one for me to answer because in my view, uh, all of these are, are somewhat related. Um, and so if you were asking for a priority, it, it, is, it is a difficult one. I can say um, that the creation of a sensing network, um, I'll go back to the discussion I had a few minutes ago about um, Santa Fe Fireship Coalition. Part of the success of that is a lot of viewpoints. And to me, you get a better view when you're getting a lot of viewpoints, whether it's social science or whether it's technology and data. So the more we can create a sensor network that is both ground-based uh, and up to the satellites that integrates and gives us real-time forecasting and mapping, um, that to me is a huge priority. But that actually falls into some of the other priorities, like putting that data in a single usable place where all levels of government are sharing data significantly using that data to create situational awareness in real time for boots on the ground, uh, and ultimately a network of communication that links all of these priorities together. Again, in summary, it's hard for me to prioritize because they work together, but that's probably how I would do so uh, if, since you asked me to do so. 
Thank you for that. I, last week we had the new NASA Administrator, Senator Nelson, and he was here. We were talking about collaboration and how much is there and how much it's, how it's working and so forth. He was uh, he was pretty confident that uh, there was a lot of collaboration from at least NASA in, in the areas of hurricane tracking and firefighting, mm -hmm. floods, so forth. Um, my question would be uh, this whole idea of remote sensing. Um, are there, should there be, or are there already uh, ways where that, that information is being coordinated and communicated to local uh, and state foresters uh, in uh, communities to improve um, prevention of, and also maybe mitigation in the area of forest fires? Do you know anything about that? Um, Congressman, uh, I, I can give you my opinion from being somebody at the local level. I've always had the impression that um, that, that data exists and that it should be reachable. And in places where uh, there are good relationships, um, it often is, but it is really dependent on the caliber of those relationships. There are places nationally, we've referenced Wildland Fire Leadership Council, we've referenced um, National Interagency Fire Center, where integration is happening, and I think it's happening well and thoroughly. Um, but it's not always getting down to the community level where decisions about prevention and mitigation can be made appropriately. And that's uh, potentially a, a, a huge place for future improvements. Well, that's something we're going to have to work on. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Uh, Mr. Sherman of California is recognized. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank uh, the committee for having this hearing. I take it personally. Uh, having been evacuated from my home just uh, a couple of years ago uh, with the Saddle Ridge Fire, um, representing a district that goes right up against the city limits uh, uh, of Los Angeles. Uh, Mr. Geisler, uh, in your written testimony, you note uh, that the buildup of hazardous fuels on many of our public managed, publicly managed lands are at historic levels. And you further note uh, that uh, past management activities have actually made our public lands even more vulnerable. Uh, how can research improve the maintenance uh, issues so as to reduce the likelihood of fires uh, like those we've seen in California? Uh, thank you, Congressman, for that question. And, you know, as you said, uh, our forests and landscapes are really at a point where uh, their resiliency is, is questionable in many places. Uh, science and research has really been doing a lot of work relative to how we best uh, turn the corner on these landscapes. There's always ongoing uh, research related to fuels and, and what is on the ground. Uh, there's a lot of work within FIA, the Forest Inventory and Analysis, uh, world where essentially we are learning more and more about what the conditions are, what the state of our forest is, so that we can better address the issue that's there. And the I will say the forest inventory and analysis uh, program through the Forest Service is one of those things that is kind of an unsung hero, providing us with a lot of longstanding data and information related to how our forests and landscapes have changed over time. So it's there, uh, it's ongoing below the, the surface and it does not get a lot of uh, notice uh, from those of us that are outside of the community, but making sure that we have effective funding for forest inventory and analysis, and then programs like the Joint Fire Sciences Program that helps coordinate the research utilizing some of that data is really some of the critical needs. Thank you, uh, firefighters, emergency officials, uh... Uh, Dr. Clements, uh, you uh, indicated how they and community uh, leaders can struggle uh, with disaster management. Uh, wildfire season is increasingly becoming uh, year round. Uh, our firefighters are being asked uh, to work impossible hours in hazardous conditions. Uh, uh, Dr. Clements, uh, how can uh, we better use scientific modeling and the enormous amount of data that have been collected to better predict the number of firefighting personnel that we will need? Thank you for your question, Congressman. 
Um, so that's a that's a difficult question. So what we could do in the future is using some of these state of the art fire prediction models to look at what what we should expect. Well, how big are these fires going to be given you know changes in wind, changes in temperature and, and fuels? And so that could give us an idea of what resources and suppression needs are going to be uh, required in the future. So that's one way to use some of these new models that are very uh, high resolution to look at what those needs could be in the future. Thank you. And I also want to take a minute to thank the Appropriations Subcommittee uh, for uh, funding a project or recommending the funding of a project in my district to replace uh, invasive and uh, highly flammable uh, um, uh, shrubs uh, with uh, native and, uh, and fire resistant shrubs right there uh, in the area of the, uh, of the Cessna and, uh, and Saddle Ridge fires uh, that we've suffered through uh, in, uh, in recent years. Uh, I uh, thank you for your comments and I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Dr. Baird is recognized. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and uh, Ranking Member Lucas for, for holding this hearing. You know, I always uh, learn something in this committee, and so I really appreciate the professionalism and the expertise of our witnesses, and I thank them for being here today. Uh, I'm going to continue on a little bit uh, the, with the conversation my colleague, Mr. Webster, was having, and so my questions are going to be um, to the Chief Litzenberg as well as to uh, Mr. Geisler. But Chief, you mentioned in your testimony you highlighted that the collaboration among local fire departments with federal research and working with NSF, NIST, or NIST, and NASA needs to further grow to improve the nation's wildfire response. And then you followed that with eight fields of future focus on this matter, such as remote sensing, fire mapping, and others. And so in that context, then I want to extend my, my question to be, how can we use these tools that you mentioned there uh, to really increase the active force management and the implementation of fuel treatments? Because I think those have a real impact uh, on being able to prevent many of these wildfires. And so with that, Chief, if you would care to comment, I would appreciate that. Thanks for the question, Congressman. And uh, yeah, I'll give you my perspective again as, as a local responder. Um, and I think my, my perspective is probably shared by many responders and fire chiefs. Um, I, I said it a few minutes ago and, and I'll say it again. I, I do believe that there is a lot of data that's being created and a lot of very smart people, many of whom are here today, um, who are doing great things around fire science. And often the missing link is how do I, as a community responder, how do I, as a fire chief, get that data in a place that's usable and then use it to do prevention and mitigation primarily? Um, I, I often look at um, communities, and we have the term fire adaptive communities now, but I often look at communities as uh, an organism, much like a human. And if you look at um, your body over the years, you've counted on somebody to get data about you, whether it's I'm doing brain scans when you got a headache, whether it's looking at, at your heart when you have chest pain, uh, you know, evaluating your blood, and, and you get data points. And then you have somebody who looks at those data points and gives you a recommendation. And what do you do about that? And what do you do in, in terms of prevention to make sure that the ultimate effect is, is not catastrophic on your body? Communities and ecosystems are no different. And we're creating data points. And in my opinion, what we really need is a place where that data is collected in one single place where everybody is, is dumping everything that they're learning into a single place. And then there's somebody or a committee or a group or, or an organization, much like a doctor, who's telling me as a local community, what do I do with that data? How can I make my forest healthier? How can I make my community safer? And ultimately, um, how can I provide for public safety to those who want to live safely within the urban interface? Thank you. Mr. Geisler, would you care to add to that? Yes. and, and I and Chief Litzenberg uh, really hit the nail on the head. It's the availability and the utilization of all of this data that is being created and making sure that we have the ability to, to share it across uh, the various jurisdictions. 
But, and, it, and it has happened in some places. I can give you an example of within my own state where we utilize data from federal, state, and local who we have come together and are sharing it across jurisdictional boundaries to develop a forest health strategy for our state, prioritizing all of the landscapes across all jurisdictions. And that is in collaboration with the US Forest Service, state agencies and locals. And it, it ties back to our forest health management. And then we also have used it on our wildfire strategy that we're building out. Uh, but it takes a lot of interagency discussions and it takes an environment where there's a shared mission on how we need to address or what the, the end goal should be. And that again, much like Eric said, is I, a lot of folks are, are organizations are essentially working on their own and discovering things. And if that leads to sometimes reinventing wheels and to the point of getting it all to one location, getting the information on how this can be used, collected, analyzed, and then sent out and communicated is just absolutely critical. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm out of time, so I yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Mr. Byer is recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair, very much. Um, this is fascinating stuff. And, and I'd like to start with Dr. McCarty because the, the NASA's, the Space and Aeronautics Subcommittee of, of this committee held a few, hearing a few weeks ago on NASA climate science work and we heard an awful lot about the growing commercial remote sensing industry's ability to support NASA's earth science activities, but primarily through data buys. But the hearing also identified questions about commercial data transparency, accessibility, license restrictions, that could have implications for free and open access to federally funded earth science data. So what are your perspectives on the opportunities and challenges of commercial remote sensing data sets and wildfire research? Well, thank you for that question, Congressman. I mean, commercial data is proprietary. And so when we, um, and I, you know, full disclosure, have been a NASA funded PI who has access to those commercial data buys, but they must be in the regions in which my, the project that I have competitively, um, you know, applied for has been selected. And so if I, for instance, for FireXAQ, which was a partnership between NOAA and NASA, I was on the NASA side. I was able to look at um, commercial data sets and still I'm able to look at commercial data sets for regions and fires that we flew the DC-8 through the smoke plumes. But if I wanted to expand that to other states where we didn't fly, that would not necessarily be permitted. I would, I would need to go back and request and, and ask why. Um, I would also say that the, co the commercial data is of high quality. It's definitely an add-on. It's one of those data fusion products we wanna include it requires a high level of computing and data science and coding skills to implement. Um, our NASA and NOAA Earth Observation products are, are often some of the best in the world. They're, they're plug and play in a lot of ways. And um, our commercial data sets are, are not quite there, but that's not necessarily their business model. So they haven't been given the right incentive, uh, stick or carrot uh, to, to develop those products. They would be something that would, um, fill in that gap if we want multiple daily um, imagery. But to really get at some of the fire weather, you, you need kind of like a weather, a weather system, a geostationary system where you're getting something every 15 minutes, all, all, half hour. All, all the time, yeah. But let me ask a, a, a larger, more existential question. It seems that fire science has changed an awful lot since I was a kid. Smokey the Bear, I was impressed that we heard the 78% or 84% are still human caused. But back then, no fires, and we, and then later on, I served for a number of years on that House Natural Resources Committee, where my some of my friends were like, we need to do much more forestry um, because we have to clear out all the trees, and that way they won't burn down. And then you had our most recent president talking about raking the forests in Norway. Um, where where exactly are? And I know climate change is complicated. All of this immensely, um, and you know, there I, I know you have projects with with prescribed fires. But is there a, a larger scientific sense of how best to manage forests? Yeah, with respect to fires. 
we have, I would say, a coalescing uh, convergence. There's always more science is, is uh, you know, frustratingly like that. There's always more to know. Um, however, what we have learned are, you know, North America is a fire adapted ecosystem. Many of our natural areas are adapted to burn. And so to function, they, they must burn. The fire will come. I'm a Stephen Pine, the fire story, and it's shown time and time again. Um, prescribed burning is one of those forest management techniques. Like you were saying, there were no fires, right? Well, that's because there, were, there was active fire suppression. We're now in a fire deficit where we have many of our wildland areas that aren't, aren't having enough fires. And so we need more prescribed burning. And that's when we talk about indigenous burning, prescribed burning. And we have some systems that burn too much in our, in, close to our WUI, close to our agricultural systems. Um, it, but some of our rangeland systems need to be burned more. And, and, and so it becomes this very complex, what I like to call a patchwork quilt um, of what the ecosystem really looks like. And so management um, and science has to really view that complexity. And that includes our fuel systems, not just thinking of it as all grasses, having buildings um, and, and so on and so forth. Back to you. Uh, Madam Chair, with the Chief Listenberg, do you have anything to add in the last 20 seconds? I think that was a, a solid answer, and I agree entirely. Nothing, nothing significant to add. Don't make a good I look forward to the science continuing to evolve. Uh, thank you very much. So, Madam Chair, thank, yield back. Thank you. And the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Weber, is recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this would be for Mr. Clements to start with. The state with the most fires, uh, is that data readily available? Yeah, those data are uh, nationally compiled. And so it um, can be easily accessed, generally. Did I understand in your exchange with Bill Foster that I thought you said the data wasn't given. What, da what data was that? Do you remember that exchange? No. No? That was me. Okay, uh, and then I'll go to uh, Mr. Geisler. Do we have, uh, you had a discussion with Daniel Webster. Uh, do we have enough interagency inter interaction and is there somebody that tracks that and how successful that's been? I, we have exceptional interagency uh, cooperation at both the national, regional and state levels. Uh, there, we have a lot of discussions among the state foresters, the emergency managers on how we can improve it, along with our federal partners at FEMA and the USDA Forest Service and DOI and others. Uh, the collaboration revolves around the National Interagency Fire Center uh, in Boise, as well as the Wildland Fire Leadership Council. And we really try to go through what is an ongoing uh, continuous improvement kind of cycle with relation to that. Uh, the, the, all of the agreements that are in place, in fact, whether it be a master agreement uh, between federal agencies and states or numerous state to state or, or state to local agreements, all usually have some form of an assessment piece that's involved in it, whereby we take a look at how it's working and try to improve on that. Has, the, has there been a discussion about whether or not you, if you widen the rights of ways in some of these heavily forested areas, that that would reduce uh, some of the wildfires? Uh, those typically are occurring at the local and state level as we do our wildfire prevention planning. Uh, you know, there's a lot of work that even within your home state of Texas with the community wildfire preparedness planning, uh, whereby you take and look at a community and determine what would be the best way to, to mitigate the risk of, to that community, as well as mitigate the risk to the natural resources around it. And those are all part of a kind of a process that's utilized that we try to get done, obviously, before the fire gets accomplished. Uh, Texas, in fact, has an excellent program that they're, that they're utilizing in order to have those discussions. And to your point, I mean, a lot of it occurs all across the United States, across all levels of, of, uh, of government and within the local communities and even private citizens. Uh, a lot of it, but a lot of it involves uh, just giving a framework of how to get it done. And that's where a lot of funding and, and research could be utilized just on the social sciences side of how we get this information better understood and, and, and accepted by our public as well as 
uh, funding on facilitation and process in order to get these things done. If there's a place where we, we say we need to really accelerate on a curve, that, that is one place that you could point to. What state would you say has the most wildfires? <laughs> uh, I think the last time we checked, it was if you look at sheer numbers, it was California. But but to the point of of uh, Dr. Clemens, uh, all of that information is is readily available through the National Interagency Fire well, Center as we all report our fires up through the the systems that are involved. Right. Well, uh, let me to the follow up question to that is: Would most of those fires have been caused by utility? Uh, companies, I think one of the questions I had, we talked about insurance, one of the, some of the testimony earlier about insurance companies were extremely interested, uh, energy companies, or power companies were extremely interested. Would you agree that those, well, not the insurance companies, but maybe the utility companies, um, you know, lines sparking together in high wind areas, for example, is that probably the major cause of, uh, let's, for example, say California's fires? Actually, the major cause is uh, humans. Uh, we do sometimes very foolish things, whether it be dragging a chain, or with, or towing a trailer, or letting campfires. Uh, the Smoky Bear message that we talked about earlier still applies in many cases. And uh, they, the causes that you're talking about, uh, they do occur. You know, I'm not going to deny that we don't have equipment sparking with utilities, but we are working with the utilities trying to best figure out ways to minimize that risk that's out there. But if you ask for the purely, what is the, the biggest cause that you and I essentially, uh, when you look at the cost data. So are you saying this world would be a really good place if it wasn't for the humans? <laughs> uh, well, we interact with our environment and change it all the time. And I think us being better aware of what we can do to prevent that would would be a, a much better place. Sometimes we don't think about what we're doing. Uh, and it takes just some simple awareness to really make us take that extra step. Most people don't realize that they can cause a spark mowing their lawn and set a fire that easily until it happens to them. And we really do want them to understand or want everybody to understand the risk that you're taking and how you can help us. Ella, I thank you for that. I appreciate it. your indulgence, Madam Chair. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Uh, Jerry McNerney is recognized. Well, thank the Chair. I want to thank the witnesses. You know, this is really important to, to me, to my district, uh, to people in the western part of the country. I won't be able to be as entertaining as Mr. Weber um, in my questions, but I'll proceed anyway. Um, Dr. Clemens, uh, thank you again. In your testimony, you mentioned that we need more coupling of ecological conditions, atmospheric conditions, and general fire behavior for models to more accurately identify uh, climate change's impact uh, on, mod on modern wildfire dynamics. Can you elaborate a bit more on how federal science agencies can be helpful uh, in promoting this type of research? Thank you for your question, Congressman. Yeah, so a lot of this, uh, these coupled fire atmosphere models are, they're, op they're kind of, they're becoming operational, but they're not national. And they are very high computing, uh, they, they take a lot of high computing resources. You need uh, supercomputing centers to run these models. It's not that they can't be done, but you just need the resources. So funding um, centers to do that or funding um, teams to run those models operationally for regions would be uh, probably the best way to invest into getting those models uh, operational. Thank you. Um, Chief uh, Litzenberg, uh, the federal science agencies have limited or no role in the federal, uh, with the federal agencies that coordinate federal fire response. How would you recommend federal science agencies be better incorporated into federal fire wildfire response efforts? Um, Congressman, thanks for that question. Um, I, I believe that the best way to be integrated is to use existing mechanisms, because there are mechanisms that are used, that are used successfully, and perhaps they could be improved uh, in this avenue, but they're already there. Um, the, the Joint Fire Science Program is one that's taking good science, putting it in a place that's usable to practitioners. The Wildland Fire Leadership Council and the National Interagency Fire Center are also places where integration is already occurring. And, uh, and all we really need to do is, is put a focus on 
new and existing research and how it can be used and applied towards uh, emerging issues. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Clemens, again, in, in your testimony, you talk about both the importance and difficulty of collecting routine meteorological data on wildfire incidents. Do you think there's a role for federal science agencies to play in collecting more of this data? Yes, I do. I think that uh, we could, like I mentioned before, instrument aircraft, we could deploy more resources. Right now, the uh, National Weather Service Incident um, Meteorologist Program, which is like over 50 meteorologists that go to active wildfires and other disasters around the country, they deploy and they can request surface weather stations, but it takes a while to get those stations in place because they have to be driven out from a location and set up in the field. And so we could potentially have other types of technology, wind profilers, Doppler radar networks that are higher resolution that could be either deployed rapidly, like in a storm chasing manner, or um, through uh, teams that are already established with the incident command team or the fire incident. So yeah, I think the federal government could actually play a big role. Uh, it's just like hurricane hunters. We have those aircraft that go sample those hurricanes to collect the meteorological data, but we don't have that for wildfire. And it's the same type of information that we need to better model and predict what the fire is going to do and how the atmosphere is playing a role on that fire spread. And, and data uh, standardization would be helpful too, I imagine. Yeah, we have to have standards in the data as well, particularly in some of the like the remote sensing data, because a lot of these images that you can get from like private vendors is saturated. And so that means that it's like you're not getting the accurate temperature. You're not really seeing what the fire is doing. You're seeing kind of a blob on an image. So having better uh, data um, standards would be improvement for what we have currently. Well, as co-chair of the House Artificial Intelligence Caucus with my colleague, uh, Mr. Gonzalez, one of the areas I'm interested in is how AI can be used in wildfire response. Uh, Chief Litzenberg, can, can you respond to that? You know, I can do my best to respond to that um, as the non-scientist, more of the practitioner side. Um, anything that we can use to take existing information and create it in a, in a usable fashion for those of us who are, who are actually doing the boots on the ground practitioner work, um, to me is a bonus. And if that includes the use of AI, then, um, then I, I say we're, we're in. That's, that's something that should be explored into the future. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, I'm going to yield back then. The gentleman yields back. Mr. Gonzalez is recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair, and, and thank you to our uh, panel for, for being with us today and, and sharing your perspectives. Um, Mr. Geisler, I want to start with you, uh, and, and I want to talk about tree spatial patterning. Uh, so I'd like to get your thoughts on this. N new research indicates that trees in spatial patterns are more fire resistant than those uniformly or evenly spaced. Uh, should we be encouraging more managers to adopt spatial reforestation, or is more research and testing of this method required? Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, I'm not as familiar with the latest research in this that has come out. Uh, I can tell you only from a fire manager's uh, perspective that obviously changing the spatial relationship among stems or, or trees in a, in a forest obviously changes fire behavior characteristics. Uh, but then along the same lines, I, I do know that in our southern states where we do a lot of uh, intensive silviculture related to like plantation forestry, uh, those actually have created issues in the past because of the nature of the change in fuel uh, spread. So I would have to do a little bit more research to give you a, a solid answer on that. And I'm, I'm willing to follow up with you on it. Great. Thank you. And uh, uh, my next question was, how can federal science agencies assist in these efforts? Um, so I guess I'd, I'd turn it back to you. Maybe it's just we, we need more research on it, but um, I'll let you answer. Well, uh, you know, and, and again, as this, this type of research comes out, the modification of fuel profiles in general, whether it be through uh, spatial changes between trees or the removal of ladder fuels and percentages related to that, all of that stuff is are items that foresters and natural resource managers are looking at all the time, not just from the standpoint of fire management, but also from the standpoint of just pure forest health and resiliency to other things like insects and disease. So, you know, obviously increasing and, and improving the 
the research availability is always important, as well as I'm going to kind of t always tie back to the making of that research and information available to the practitioners on the ground. And, and sometimes that it requires more of a social scientist uh, to come up with how to get that best across. Uh, but, but I agree that more work is needed. Thanks. And then a somewhat related question, perhaps. Uh, obviously, you know, the United States isn't the only country that, that's dealing with wildfires. Um, there's been high profile issues with wildfires across the globe in various ways. What learnings, if any, can we take from how this is managed in other parts of the world that, that we should be applying uh, to how, how we deal with uh, wildfires in the U.S.? Uh, there's, there's actually a continuous sharing along those lines also. Uh, even within my own state, we partner with our, our fellow firefighters in British Columbia, Saskatchewan, and others on the Canadian side as we share resources across the border all the time. And uh, there's obviously a discussion of the tools that we use, be it everything from how we manage our firefighter safety to the tactics that we're utilizing. Uh, you, you've obviously or, or should have heard of where we bring firefighters in from other countries and, and even the Forest Service has gone to other countries like uh, Australia. And through all of those, we have a sharing environment. That is one of the foundational elements within the wildland firefighting community is to maintain that learning environment as we go and use different tools and techniques. And there's the Wildfire Lessons Learned Center and others that actually helps to disseminate this information. So the, the experience of, again, getting the right people in the room with a shared experience uh, that I believe Eric spoke to earlier, you get a lot of people in the room talking about the same thing and you can come up with some fairly amazing ideas. And we have made changes to our our systems and tweaked our processes in order to get better just because of the experiences that we've had with our with our uh, fellow firefighters from other countries. Great. Thank you. That's very, uh, very helpful. I appreciate your testimony and, and, and responses and I'll yield back. Uh, gentleman yields back. Mr. Kasten is recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to our witnesses. Um, Dr. Clement, I'd like to start with you, and one of the things that's always sort of struck me as the hardest thing to deal with on climate change sociologically is that is there's all these nonlinearities, and we just, we just do a bad job of anticipating um, accelerating trends. Um, it, obviously, that contributes to the increasing numbers and severity of wildfires that we've seen, but if you look just at wildfire science, as you try to predict what's going to happen over the next five, 10 years. Are there major nonlinearities that are either feedback loops making it worse or that might damp it with respect to wildfire science that we should be thinking of on the expectation that we're probably not anticipating those things very well either? Yeah, thank you for your question, uh, Congressman. Yeah, so in terms of climate change and feedback loops, as we change, uh, as the, the environment gets warmer, we're going to change the fuel structures. We're going to change our landscape. So that can impact maybe for the better at times, uh, different types of fuel structures. So we could convert some after fire, we can convert some forest to maybe grasslands and that could lessen extreme fire, but it can make it more ignit uh, ignitable as well. So there are feedbacks. Uh, it's not really my expertise. So I could look into that a little bit more and get back to you, but I think one thing that we need to consider in terms of climate change is that these trends, you know, the predictions are, you know, we have to continue look at attribution, you know, what's really causing all these things. We know it's climate change. We know it's forest management. Uh, we know it's climate induced drought and weather. So, but we can still put more science into fine tuning what those attributions are in terms of what's going to happen in the future. We could use high resolution modeling in a, a, a different state. So we can use 20, 50 um, climate scenarios and model what fires are gonna look like then. That's something that we're planning on doing. So that could be one way to kind of diagnose. That's it. And I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I gotta get two more questions. Um, Dr. McCarty, you had mentioned in your comments about, you know, we're seeing wildfires in places like the Smoky Mountains that we haven't thought about before. With these trends, are there areas or types of fires that you think are going to be more likely in the future that we need to be thinking about and preparing for? Sure, thank you for that question, Congressman. In fact, the Eastern Forest used to be called the asbestos forest by many professional foresters because 
they said that they wouldn't burn, but that is in fact not actually, uh, that was not true. It's just they have a longer fire return interval. And so we, we will expect as the Southeast becomes hotter and drier, particularly in our upland areas, that fire risk will increase. And this is a wooey question, a wildland urban interface question. We've had a lot of people move in to places like Asheville, um, you know, Knoxville, Tennessee, um, even parts of West Virginia and, you know, in Pennsylvania. So we're going to see more fire risk. The other thing is to think about, you know, NIFC reported that in 2019, just in terms of burned area, total acres burned, the state with the most wildfire is Alaska. And so Alaska is, some, is a state we, we need to have on our minds as wildland fire scientists, um, because in the future, we will see more Arctic fires, we will see more boreal fires, those fire regimes are accelerating. And in fact, we will see more of our organic carbon soils burn, and then burn through the winter and reignite in the spring. Um, and that's just a continuation of fire seasons. And, and that is a you know, a very a different type of fire management. And I do think the Alaskan Forest Service and um, the Alaskan Fire Consortium is a very professional and outstanding group. And, and they are trying through research and science to, to figure out how to work um, these these new challenges in the future. Wow. Thank you. Um, so last question with the little time I've got left is really for any of you who feel comfortable answering this, and it's it's a little beyond this committee. Um, Lael Brainerd, who's the, on the Fed Board of Governors in January, said the, the scientific evidence for climate change is unequivocal, but the magnitude of climate-related financial risks are highly uncertain. Um, and among those are wildfires. And she noted that more than 70% of the losses from natural disasters are uninsured and um, f warned of the potential to create abrupt repricing events. I spend a lot of time on the Financial Services Committee thinking about how our financial system is at stress from this. And of course, we've had some conversations about, you know, if you were an investor in PG&E, you may feel that directly from the wildfire damage. As you think about where there are big exposures to private capital from wildfires, um, in, any major concerns, and I realize this is more of a financial question than a scientific question, but you can't separate the two. They're all linked. Anybody want to comment on that? I will just say that maybe perhaps the thing we should think about is that a lot of Americans, their capital, much of their money is wrapped up in home ownership and property ownership. And in many of our Western states, and of course, in our Eastern states and Midwestern states, as they become more fire prone, then suddenly the likelihood that you lose your home or it becomes uninsurable increases. And that is just a, a huge loss to private capital. And you can only imagine what that would do to our economy and our GDP and, and just health of our population. And so that is something that's hard to predict and, and hard to imagine into the future, but is a direct financial loss. Thank you, and I'm out of time, and I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Mr. Kildee is recognized. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I really appreciate uh, you recognize me, and I do appreciate the chair holding this important hearing. Um, and thanks to the witnesses for your testimony. Uh, I come from Michigan. Uh, in fact, the northern part of my district is home to the Huron Forest, which is 737 plus acres over 70 miles. It's named after a Native American tribe that's local to our region. And the forest landscape is highly prone to seasonal fires. Uh, it's dominated by jack pines. Uh, jack pine needles are highly flammable. Uh, those seasonal fires, um, are actually part of the life cycle of the forest. Pine cones from those uh, jack pines containing seeds only open uh, as a result of, of a fire. And the Kirtland warbler, which is a great little songbird, uh, only breeds in those young jack pines. Uh, so as a result of logging in the forest, the warbler's habitat was at one point nearly completely destroyed. Uh, that little bird was almost completely extinct. 50 years later, due to prescribed burns and the protections put in place by the Endangered Species Act, the Kirtland Warbler was successfully removed from the endangered species list. Uh, and now each year, literally thousands of tourists come to that part of rural Michigan to see the Kirtland Warbler. And so it's not just a little bird, it's a really important part of what makes that place so great, so interesting and so attractive to people who come from all over the country 
just to see that rare bird. Um, so in the forest, we have to have these prescribed burns to maintain uh, and control wildfires. But this year, as part of a prescribed burn, an uncontrolled forest fire broke out and burned about 5,000 acres of that forest land. Um, climate change has contributed to these fires. Uh, due to climate change, the forests are drier, the air is less humid, winds are stronger and more sustained, and it makes it harder to control um, these controlled burns, these prescribed burns. So thankfully, no people or structures were damaged, but this is the kind of threat, uh, threat that we face. So I'm just curious, and I, I guess I would ask uh, the panels, panelists, perhaps Mr. Geisler and Chief Litzenberg, for this Huron forest that I represent or other forests across the country that do use prescribed burns to maintain forest health, as climate change increases the intensity of weather, what do we need to be doing? What do you suggest we do so that we can maintain control of these sorts of fires and ensure that we avoid a controlled burn, prescribed burn like this getting out of control like the one we saw in the Huron forest? So, so uh, yeah. go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead, Mr. Geisler, you want to start and then maybe the chief could comment? Sure. Uh, thank you. And, and actually what I was going to let you know is that, you know, the idea of like the Jack Pines situation, a lot of that revolves around the potential need for stand replacement fires, even to truly uh, manage that landscape, which we don't do because of the, the risk when you have prescribed burns. And that's why a lot of what you're seeing in the and the type of work that's being done is on a more cyclical basis and maintaining the trees at different stages. Uh, the one piece that I wanted to make sure that everyone understood is, is that when a prescribed burn is, is planned, uh, a, a plan is actually developed. And what it does is it not only is the objectives of how uh, the burn will be occurring and what the end result needs to be, but it's usually very specific on humidity, wind direction, wind speed, and others. I think that a lot of it, like you said, is, is making sure we do good planning and that we follow the plan exactly. And then if there are issues, even if they're minor, learn from those. Uh, in addition to that, a lot of the research that we've talked about throughout this hearing uh, helps to feed that in, those plans and the knowledge that we have to develop them. So again, I wanted to just kind of bring up how a prescribed burn can be done and just the need for additional research and information to feed those. Thank you. Uh, Chief, you have thoughts on this? Uh, yeah, thank you, Congressman. I'll, I'll say it briefly. So what you just described is the social phenomenon we call fire adaptation. And it does have an effect in our ecologies as well. Back in hundreds of years ago, we decided we got to suppress everything. And all of a sudden, um, we had a bigger issue than we had in the past. And now we're realizing you have to control these fuels, you have to control risks, and it's healthier for forests. Um, the more we can get information about the fuels and the more we can get information about weather to use for our planning, the better our planning will be. And I'll just say one last thing, which is, and luckily our organizations have evolved as well. And the science that our organizations and the tactics that our organizations are using to manage these forests are also getting better. So continuing to invest in those organizations and our workforces um, can't, can't be overstated. I thank you very much. And Madam Chair, I thank you for the extra time. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Ms. Wild is recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate it. Um, and thank you for this very interesting and informative hearing. Um, the recent extreme heat in the Pacific Northwest is obviously concerning for many reasons, not the least of which is the safety and health of the communities. But it's deeply troubling that we are seeing um, such a mix of limited water, dry lands, and unusually high temperatures this early in the summer. I know I'm not saying anything that you don't already know. The terrible fires we saw last summer across Western states and the lingering environmental and economic devastation highlight the importance of our scientific enterprise in informing us of climate risk and climate related disasters. Uh, the US has a number of earth observing satellite based platforms that provide useful data for wildland, um, wildland fire science, but we also rely on assets from European and other international partners. Dr. McCarty, I'm interested to know to what extent are relevant European 
and international part partner data coordinated with United States data? And how can we further utilize available international data? Well, thank you for that question. I, I will say as, as I'm not um, at NASA headquarters, some of this I, uh, I can't speak to. I uh, will try to uh, reply back in writing. Um, there are high level uh, interactions between NASA HQ and of course, um, ESA and other international space agencies. Our researchers on the ground, um, including places like um, uh, the U.S. Forest Geospatial Technology and Application Center in Salt Lake City try to utilize uh, Sentinel products. So Sentinel-2, Sent uh, which is kind of Landsat-like, but uh, higher spatial resolution and higher temporal resolution. It's overhead every three to five days, depending on clouds. Um, and some of our um, synthetic aperture radar data, which is at a 10 meter resolution from ESA, um, are now being implemented to try to look at both fire monitoring, fire detection, but also uh, mapping, better mapping fuels, fuels conditions, including things like where peatlands are, um, soil moisture and uh, fuel moisture condition. Um, and so in the research community, uh, these products are being developed and, uh, and are being you know, put forward um, to some of our federal level um, operational centers. Um, and of course, the more that we can do that in our data fusion um, process, the better the data is uh, for our agencies and for uh, our firefighters on the ground. Okay, thank you. And Chief Litzenberg, um, can you go into some more detail about the proposal uh, to develop a standard warning uh, fire scale similar to the Richter scale for earthquakes? Um, I'm particularly interested in how it would be beneficial for firefighters, but of course the public as well. Uh, I, I sure can, Kyra, someone thanks for the question. Um, so much like the Sapper Simpson hurricane wind scale, we could develop a scale for forecasting the threat of a wildland fire. Um, this type of warning system would require coordination between NOAA, the US Forest Service, the US Department of Interior and state, tribal, territorial and local officials, pretty much everybody across the board. Um, it, it would provide a standardized warning system to let communities and responders know what type of resources might be required respond to a fire and what actions should be taken, such as sheltering in place or evacuating. A lot of the cat catastrophic issues we've seen during fires are in the movement of people. And obviously that is for all of us, um, the number one value. And the more we can communicate with people what to expect, the better our response system will be. Thank you so much. I think there's great promise there. And Dr. McCarty, did you want to comment on that at all? If not, I'll yield my time. Yes, I think that this is a great idea. In fact, if you compare some of our, our fire warning systems to some of our international colleagues, often our fire warning system is seen as um, hard to interpret because it kind of looks like a color, a rainbow speedometer, essentially. Um, and uh, and we, we would need that. And, and there's a lot of social science and public health research, including built environment research that could be done that will help implement such a warning system. So it does communicate the right thing um, to people on the ground. Um, so that that's not causing problems for our wildland firefighters. Thank you very much. With that, Madam Chair, I yield back. Uh, thank you. The gentlelady yields back. Mr. Perlmutter is recognized. As the last questioner. So uh, I want to follow up on uh, Ms. Wild's questions. Um, to Dr. McCarty and Chief uh, Litzenberg, we were talking about satellites and uh, coordinating with uh, the Europeans and others, uh, obviously the Canadians. Um, what steps have been taken? Um, you said that NOAA is a number of years away from really having satellites to monitor these fires, uh, but can we monitor them with some of our military assets, our <laughs> intelligence assets? Be um, and I'm saying we sometimes in Colorado, obviously, we had big fires last year and we had to call in the National Guard to assist our firefighters. Uh, can we call in uh, some of our uh, space assets? Uh, have, have you, either of you, uh, uh, heard about that? Yes, I mean, the, the project I know about is FireGuard. I'd actually like to defer to Dr. Clements because he has worked with the data. I have not needed to work with that in my lab. And so... I know about it. Dr. Clements, would you like to comment on that? 
Well, thank you. I, I haven't actually been able to work with the data because it's not available for the research community. I've seen examples of it. And so that's really all I know. And when we do deploy to wildfires, we know it's there. We know that the F fans or fire behavior analysts are getting access to that, at least on some of these big incidents. So it's available, but I have not been able to really work with those data. Chief, Chief Litzenberg, uh, have you uh, had any experience using some of our uh, other assets besides uh, th that we might have available through the military or the intelligence community? Uh, Congressman, uh, I have not personally had a lot of experience with that, but I'll add to what Dr. Clements just said. Um, a lot of what is available when it is available is when large instant management teams are in place. And unfortunately, the vast majority of incidents across the nation, a, a large instant management team is not put into place. It's managed by local responders, whether they're from local government or from the state or from the Forest Service. So the more that we can get that, that information that's usable to all, the better we will be. I have not personally had that experience. Okay. Um, let me ask this question. So Dr. McCarty, or, or to any of the panelists, um, last year one of our fires called the East Troublesome Fire, um, which is the second largest we've had uh, ever, the thing that was most disturbing about it, it um, was growing at about four or 5,000 acres a day, and then in one day uh, grew by 120,000 acres, and we lost some lives, and um, it was up in a very, it was part of Rocky Mountain National Park and uh, near Grand Lake. I mean, how can we use science to predict when there's going to be an explosion like that in terms of fighting wildfires? My quick answer to that is, in addition to these fire weather uh, models that Dr. Clements has mentioned, um, we, we actually do need better, um, higher resolution, not just fuels mapping, but fuels condition um, down to the hour. This could be used by incident command, and then that would tell us where would we likely see these types of explosive um, forest fires. And again, I, you know, uh, Mr. Geisler has mentioned working with British Columbia. They had a similar situation in 2017. Um, and, and they are, the Canadian Forest Service is working towards a similar process. So I will defer to the other panelists. Yeah, Mr. Geisler, could you follow up on that and, and kind of explain your experience? Uh, yeah, actually, uh, uh, as was said, I, there are a lot, number of monitoring systems that are looking at fuels and other uh, predictive uh, data in order to give us that heads up. Uh, the mesonet that Representative Lucas talked about has fuels data in real time uh, is, as a part of it. So we were able to actually look at the moisture content and fuel typing uh, at all of these sites across the entire state at any given moment. Uh, and so what it does is it allows the fire manager to anticipate. Uh, you know, just this past year, we had a wind event which took us from a slow fire season to our historic fire season in a matter of a couple of days. And a lot of that really came down to, uh, we knew that the wind event was going to occur, but being able, while the wind event was ongoing, to have that ongoing realization of changes would have been, a, would have been another assistance. So there are various systems that are in place that allow this prediction to go, but they just don't have the coverage to really give a national or a regional picture. They're highly isolated at this point. Thank you. Uh, my time's expired. I yield back. The gentleman yields back, and uh, I believe we have no additional members uh, available to ask questions. So before we bring this hearing to a close, I want to thank the witnesses for the time they spent with us today, their expertise, their testimony. It's been enormously helpful to us as we think about what further steps uh, we should take here in the Science Committee. The record will remain open uh, for two weeks for additional statements from members or any additional questions the committee may ask of the witnesses. And we do ask witnesses if we have questions, if you could please answer them, if possible, within that two-week period that we would be enormously grateful. So at this point, the witnesses are excused with our thanks, and this hearing is now adjourned.